All right. So, hey, how's it going, man? Uh, it's uh, It's been a while since we've been uh, in the same vicinity. I mean, actually, we're kind of in the same vicinity now, but like yeah. before, but but I can't thank you enough for coming on here, man. I just, I was, um, I was talking to Matt Westra and he was, uh, I, I had lost track of you and he's like, Oh no, he's doing this. And yeah, he was, you know, and I, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad we got to link back up. That was, I was really fortunate and it was really yeah. cool. I like what I, I love your, um, the way your career path went. Like we were in the, you know, we're in the 17th and then you, uh, you know, we'll get into this in a minute, but you, you know, like transitioned to PJ and, then you started doing stuff like that. I mean, it's just a fascinating career. So there are some there are some weird weird stepping stones in between Tac P and PJ. Um, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, please. Let's. Uh, yeah, tell me. Like I was talking, talk, we were talking about it before. Your dad. You're a military uh, kid. Yeah. Uh, so that did that have? I mean, obviously it had some sort of influence. Did you? Was it um, based directly on that, or were you just that was something you wanted to do, or kind of like you know? What um, do you think? I think up until you know. 17, 18, uh, there was no way I was joining the military. Um, right. you know, uh, I thought what my dad did was pretty cool. He was an F 15 maintainer. Um, but at the same time I had, I had, um, dreams of grandeur, I guess, uh, I was gonna, I was gonna be a pro snowboarder or something, you know, go to school, oh. school and then, you know, after snowboarding was done, go be a writer. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> a 17 year old who doesn't look more than like 10 feet in front of himself. Uh, I right, didn't, right. didn't really have a plan. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, my dad influenced me in the way that most dads do, I think. And it was like, well, you're either going to school or you're joining the military, but you're not living here, you know? So <laughs> right. that's how that kind of transpired. Okay. I, uh, uh no, yeah. 99. Okay. So you got in 99. And then, uh, you, um, how, tell me about that. Cause a lot of guys have different stories about how they got in. Some got it guaranteed to be attack P some, uh, you know, got it. They had some job, they didn't know what they were going to do and they saw the recruiter in basics. So yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. I could write novels about what I haven't known in my life. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, college was, uh, was a short stint in college, went to the illustrious university of Alaska Anchorage on a scholarship for a little bit. Um, right on. and then I just stopped going to school cause it didn't interest me. Other things did. Sure, sure. Um, so yeah, I signed up in 99. I went off to basic in 2000 and I really didn't know anything about the air force. I, uh, I actually, I think I went in as a security forces. Okay. That was the bullet there. Um, and while I was there, the TAC P recruit, I didn't know TAC P pararescue combat control. I didn't know any of those things. So this TAC P recruiter shows up. Um, damn, I wish I could remember his name, Matt old, older dude. I mean, this is in 2000. I'll think of it later. Anyway, yeah, they gave us the spiel. Go, you know, yeah. go drop bombs and do all these things. And this is all pre-9-11. So looking back, yeah. like, what were they dropping bombs on? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Um, went down to Herbie and and I think I what was I Hawk 5-2 is what I is what oh, I okay. graduated. So right, right. I kind of just fell into it every step of the way, really. Um yeah. I fell in love with it. Yeah. So, so did you, um, were you a airborne volunteer in tech, in tech school or did I you, were. I was okay. the airborne. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot yeah. about that. You had to volunteer yeah. for it. Um, uh, but they, they lost all their, <clears throat> either their funding or their slots. I forget what happened. Um, one of the weirder things that happened early on was, uh, I actually grew up in Alaska, um, with Jared Hodges. Uh, oh, okay. If you've ever met Haji, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah, his dad actually ran uh, Alpenglow, the ski area, right up, the, right up the street. So, um, oh no kidding, hang out there and monkey around in the summer times, and that's where I learned to snowboard with him. But yeah, we were like oh, about that? growing up, and I lost touch with him. And uh, when I was when I was finishing up uh, Tac P school, um, I was supposed to go to Fort Campbell initially, and okay. uh, I swapped last minute. I swapped assignments with this dude who wanted to be down closer to the south and I want to be up in the Pacific Northwest. So I swapped with him for Fort Lewis. Um, okay. I got a call from what was going to be my sponsor at Fort Campbell. And it was a senior Emmett Hodges. You know, oh man. Name pop up. We haven't seen each other in a couple of years. It was, it was kind of wild. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I ended up running into Haji at the 17th when he went over, uh, yeah, yeah. when he was over at uh, fifth group. Right. Right. In Iraq. So, um, so he didn't, uh, so you ended up going to Lewis for right out of tech school. Okay. And then, going- uh, yeah, fifth ASOS or uh, the group? Okay. No, nope, went to the fifth, um, and uh, I mean, had probably too much fun. You know, um, met uh, well, I met a lot, lot of, lot of guys um, that have, you know, gone on to do some pretty amazing things. But uh, you know, there was John Knight was there at the time. He was the, you know, the big, 
Yeah, oh, yeah. Presentation. Um, <laughs> Rob Zachary, Courtney Henson, Mike Griffiths, a lot of those dudes. You know, those yeah. guys, the young, the young airmen, TACP <laughs> looked at in awe. You know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Nipe is like the the West Coast legend. He's like the you know everybody that's been to like you know Washington or Colorado or you know all that mm-hmm. all that side. That's like everybody. He's he and I think Kauai too. He was a uh, big influence on a lot of those guys. A lot of you guys. Yeah. Um. Yeah. He's a great dude. Um. So then, uh, that what time frame was this when you were at the fifth? Um. So I I got stationed there October of two thousand. And then okay. uh, was it uh, 2003, I think, was the, yeah, it was my first deployment. And it, and actually, it was really weird how it worked out. Um, I got married in 2002 uh, to my still uh, hanging in there wife. Um, we had our daughter. And then in that time, I forget what it was. It was uh, John Knife and Jay Dio were looking for augmentees to come over to first group. You know, they were looking for like younger guys. I was a senior airman at the time. And, uh, I'm still not really sure how it happened because I was kind of a knucklehead, but um, yeah, they, they brought me over to first group and uh, I thought I was just going over as like an augmentee, you know, so they sent me to jump school and I was back from jump school for like a month or two uh, out on some TDY. I was on a, a jump trip with um, John and the rest of the first group tech P shop. And while we were there, uh, he gives me a call. He's like, Hey man, you're going back to Fort Lewis. And I thought I had kind of effed something up and he's like, no, you're going you know, in like oh. six days. Wow. So, uh, Griff and Courtney Henson and John Lowry and I got home and headed out to Afghanistan on, on like what was like a six, I think it was like six, seven days notice, which my wife was super stoked about with our four month old. Yeah, daughter. I can imagine. <laughs> right. How old was your kid at the time? Uh, four months. Oh, geez. Yeah. And she's yeah. 20 now though. She's doing good. She's, yeah, uh, a fun, a it's just I, a lot of people have that same story. Like they they have a little baby at home or their wife's pregnant and they're like, all right, I'll see you later. I'm going to be deploying for, you know, five or six months. And then yeah. they have to kind of I feel bad for the the wives that have to kind of deal with that stuff. But I mean, it's kind of the nature of the beast, you know. Oh, she was a trooper, um, yeah. you know, and for the all the subsequent deployments since then, too. But uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was kind of eye opening. And I, I mean, like I said, I could I could write novels on the things i don't know i was so clueless back then you know <laughs> right john probably did me one of the biggest favors in my adult life by uh just kind of throwing me right in the fire you know it was like a sink or swim situation so yeah, yeah. i did more of one than the other it's you know it's up for the <laughs> young. right right but, uh, uh so then tell me about that deployment was this the one that we were talking about earlier or did that come later um yeah so uh speaking of getting thrown right into the fire uh, I really lucked out, first of all, going over there with guys like Courtney Henson and Mike Griffith and John Lauer. I mean, I've been, I've been trying to think of how, how I'm going to kind of frame the two career fields that I've spent the most time in. And, um, you know, you don't want to bash either career field. Like I, I had a lot of fun as a TACB, especially on the soft side. Um, but there was one thing that was kind of always lacking to me. And that was like, you know, dudes to take other guys under your, under their wing, you know, yeah. um, there was a lot of guys I met along the way. It was like, they were kind of, kind of lone wolf in it. And, you know, you guys like me, young dudes were, were just kind of left to their own devices to figure it out, which. Yeah. A lot of times. Yeah. Um, yeah, no Griff and Courtney, uh, and John, those guys, they were, they were pretty, pretty cool. Um, showing me the way. And then uh, I lucked out with a 20th group team. So we, you know, we did the thing where we go to Bagram, see just starts doling people out and right. me bright eyed and bushy tailed to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, camp Chapman okay. in, in the host province there. And, um, I didn't know there was actually a uh, like a fob and a safe house out there, which right. Camp Chapman was like two mud huts and a tent at the time. So yeah, I don't know if safe house is really the right word, but yeah, I ended <laughs> up getting out of off of forty seven on Salerno. Um, and oh yeah, that's way over there. Yeah, yeah, all my shit, and I'm looking around at like these conventional army dudes. Like I don't see any of the SF guys, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some, you know, uh, Sergeant Major comes up and is like, you know, hey, Air Force, what are you looking for? You know, I was like, oh, I'm looking for the Special Forces guys, you know. And uh, <laughs> he's like, yeah, they're not here, dude. They're they're like 45 minutes to an hour that way. Yeah. Um, and so uh, he pointed me over to some OGA dudes, it's, you know, in 2003. So big, yeah. bearded out, rough looking guys. And I, I can't grow a beard to save my life. I look like I'm 12 years old, always have. I look <laughs> even more like I was 12 years old when I was in my twenties. Um, yeah. so I probably looked like the biggest dope, like toting 
Pelican cases and weapons cases just shit everywhere. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I hopped in this random Hilux with these uh, OGA dudes and they just, on my word, took me back over to Camp Chapman. <laughs> They're like, that yeah, sounds legit. Yeah, right, let's go. <laughs> planes, trains, and automobiles, man. So I get over there and uh, the team was super cool. They were a much older team. They're a guard team. It was 20th group team. Um, they definitely took their time, um, took their opportunity to pick on the young Air Force guy, which, you know, it was, they treated me like their little brother. And it was fair. Yeah. But, and like, uh, you know, we were, I think I was there for three days and they, they had a, a mounted patrol. They wanted to go out to Lawara, which the year prior was uh, a fob or a small fob anyway, maybe like a cop. I don't know if we called them cops back then, but um, essentially it had been overrun or it had, it, it there was some reason they had to close it down. So the idea behind it was the team sergeant wanted to take the team back out there and essentially see if they could just drum up some trouble, you know? Um, and again, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I started talking right. to the, the 18 Bravos on the team. Like I, at that point I had never fired a 240 Bravo. Uh, <laughs> I'd never run through a saw. I mean, I had my M4 and that was about it. Sure. Um, so they actually ran me through a bunch of IADs, walked me through all the weapon systems, um, basically until I couldn't get it wrong or got it less wrong. Um, <laughs> and that way, no matter where I was, you know, we were driving out, like I, I at least wasn't completely clueless. Right, right. Uh, I think I told the team sergeant at one point, like, hey, you know, the radio is my weapon. Uh, so <laughs> standard. <yeah. laughs> and he was like, cool, man. If you don't put two cans of ammo through that, you know, that that 240 before you touch your radio, I'm going to kill you myself. <laughs> you know? um, it's Roger that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We went out to Lawara and nothing really happened. We, we, um, you know, while we were out there, we, I had an AC 130 each night. I, I, uh, uh, we had some armed escort on the way out there, uh, with a tens and, uh, yeah, nothing kind of boring. And it was, it was a cool trip uh, on the way out because I got to know all the guys I definitely got picked on a lot. I started to figure out who's who on the team. Yeah you know, in the pecking order of things. And then uh, I think like after four or five days out in Lawara, we were on our way back. And this is my very first, you know, mission with these guys, very first deployment. And then, uh, yeah, November 3rd, 2003, uh, we're coming back through one of the same wadis we'd come out in. Um, there had been a lot of Pakistani border guards out in that area because uh, we're right on the border. And uh, they weren't there anymore, which was weird because there was like 100 of them just a few days prior. Oh, and, no. I think everybody kind of had their hackles up at that point. And then, yeah, we sure. went into this wadi and um, I think the second gun truck in the convoy uh, took an RPG. They had the medic in the, in the turret and then they, they blew out. And then um, I was in the next truck. I was in a uh, uh, Toyota Tacoma, like an actual mm -hmm. Tacoma, not a Hilux. It was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> and I had a couple seventh group guys. They were actually ripping out four twentieth group. So they were doing like their left seat, right seat thing. It was their team captain sure. there. Um, their medic, their Delta. Um, okay. We were driving. The captain was in the bed of the truck on like this weird welded gun mount to uh, 240. You yeah. know, um, but uh, differences in SOPs. I learned that lesson really quick. That's why you train together. Uh, right. Right. Ninth group blew through this, this near ambush and seventh group was like immediate counter assault. So like we turn our little Tacoma right into this hillside. We're 150, meters maybe 200 meters away we got probably eight to ten dudes with uh pks and rpgs and i still don't oh, yeah. know how everybody survived but um oh my god uh yeah uh pat you know the team captain the seventh group dude he's in the bed of the truck he was the most exposed obviously i mean he took a round i think through his if i remember right through his forearm through the bill of his hat through his m4 and then in the feed tray of the 240 like right in the very beginning Oh man, was it in op after that? Oh yeah, the two forty. No, the, yeah. the only gun that was going to do us any real good was was pretty much out. Um, and then uh, what's really crazy is Rick, the Delta. He actually was the one that ran me through some IADs. I didn't even know what IADs were when I first showed up. <laughs> right, right. So I had it burned into my brain, like ambush right. You know, go to the left side of the truck. Basically, he he, took, he he's responsible for probably saving my life because I just knew instinctively go to the left side of the truck, get behind the engine block, return yeah, fire. Yeah. It was like, he made it so simple for me, you know? And, uh, and that's what I did. Uh, I think I went through like five or six magazines. Um, I saw like one dude, the entire, yeah. deck. <laughs> it, was just, it was so overwhelming. Uh, I did try sure. to radio out of the truck. Uh, it was shot. I got it hanging on my wall now. 
Um, the 117 oh, was oh. shot. Uh, NVGs were shot. Everything was just shot to shit. So um, uh, Rick ended up taking some shrapnel or getting shot. I can't remember anymore, but like right in the ass and then in the knee. So both dudes that I'm in the truck with are shot. We're all kind of yes. a fire. Um, Rick is standing up, shooting, calling out targets to Pat who's now standing up with an M79 lobbing rounds, you know, uh, 40 Mike Mike up on this hill. But I think what saved the whole, the whole thing was, um, uh, one of our 18 Charlies, our Terp and, um, uh, one of our echoes basically hopped in a gun truck. Cause nobody knew what the hell was going on. The rest of the team hadn't come into the, into the water yet. A lot of the team was already like blown through and it's just our truck is, is stuck there. Um, oh my God. So you guys are out there by yourself essentially. Yeah, for like 15, 20 minutes of just nonstop. Oh, my God. And then uh, one of the gun trucks behind us ended up coming into the fight. Uh, and they had the senior Delta. He drove in. And, I mean, I don't I don't know. They're, one of the Charlies was in the back seat. Or, no, he's one of the Echoes. He's a 19th group guy attached to the team. He got shot in both legs. Um, one of the Bravos was in the turret. Uh, he started taking rounds through the chicken plate. So he gets off. But, I mean, they started drawing some of the fire away from us and returning a little more fire. So we kind of started – to turn the tide a little bit um myself and the delta uh ran one after the other to the next truck just a little further down the wadi just to get the hell out and sure. then we realized those dudes were all getting shot up now um and what really kind of turned the whole thing around is coming back in it was uh it was one of the uh again the charlie's the terp and um i'm not sure if these guys are even still in or not so i'm trying to use their names but sure sure or where they're at you know but uh yeah no it's cool um, yeah, they came back in with a Mark 19 and it was really wild because Mark 19 has got a lot of range on it. I mean, this dude was laying down some pretty accurate fire at just a few hundred meters with a Mark 19. I mean, he just peppered the ridge line. So that's awesome. Randomly Casey ever sees this. He gets credit. Uh, he was the dude, <laughs> um, uh, that just like lit this ridge line up and our turp was like helping him like reload ammo. Uh, he was in it too. It was a cool dude, man. Nice. Um, but yeah, when it was all said and done, like our team sergeant, medic, Charlie, I think we had five dudes wounded, like actually wounded. Um, and then, uh, yeah, my 117 was out. So they had already sent a request for uh, CAS up to the Sea of uh, I ran up the side of the hill and with a team captain and got eyes on these dudes that were on the backside of the hill where we had just been ambushed from. And they were yeah. still shooting at our, our ditch. Uh, while well, they were making their way to these uh, two trucks. So at this point, um, a couple of Apaches and A-10s started checking on uh, my tad. <laughs> nice. These are all the lingo. Uh, right, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, the Apaches were closer. The A-10s were still out a little bit, and I, I had better comms with them. So I just relayed through them to the Apaches, um, like uh, where the position of the two trucks was. And it was like eight dudes, at least what we saw was eight dudes with a bunch of RPGs and heavy weapon, heavy and light weapons. So uh that was good enough for me. We, we swapped oh, yeah. trucks uh, before nice. they could get across the border. Um, and then, uh, yeah. With the Apaches or the A-10? Sorry. I'm, I... Apaches. Okay. Uh, it was awesome. Pretty, it was pretty sick, man. Like, that was one of my first, like, defining moments in combat is, like, watching this Apache come out from behind this hill in front of this Hilux that now is trying to outrun uh, a gunship. And then just watching <laughs> this thing just obliterate. It was, it was, a, it was a good feeling. I was probably... Uh, a little more emotional and less professional than I should have been in that moment, but it was my first time, you know? Oh my God. Yes. I mean, I, yeah, I can't. Yeah. It was, of course you were, man. Gee, it was, I mean, you were at that point who knew what was going to happen. I mean, you, you had, you know, people wounded. I mean, you're, you were there by yourself for a, a long time. Just earlier I that year, I think, um, you know, uh, so that year, like Jake Frazier, I think was the year earlier and like Ray Lozano, <clears throat> you know, so like these things, this is like these young dudes, that were, you know, doing their first, uh, you know, pumps overseas. It was kind of like, you know, th that was kind of like, my mind was like, well, I'm hiding behind this engine block, you know, for yeah. minutes or something. Um, oh my God. But uh, yeah, no, after that, I was really tight with that team. Um, I mean, you just one, one near death experience and like, we're good. <laughs> uh, um, brought in the. Well, that Apache, that, I mean, just using those Apaches is speaks volumes for those guys. I mean, that's like, you know, it, it, up until that point, you were just kind of like one of the team. But then, you know, when you can bring in that kind of firepower, that's the whole mm -hmm. point of you being there. You know, that they're like, okay, this is this guy's legit. I mean, I'm sure they, that gave you a lot of street cred. After that, um, yeah, I had uh, 
we had the A-10s kind of escort us off the X, uh, and they stayed on station for a couple hours, and then I had them replaced with a B-1 and then an AC-130, like, for the whole movement back, because we had two trucks down. We ended up slinging. Uh, we left that Tacoma because it was shot up um, pretty bad. It did make it, like, another mile down the road. Uh, shout out to Toyota. The engines are actually <laughs> bulletproof. Um, <laughs> But uh, it ended up dying up on the side of this hill. We we just left it. I mean, I think the thing had like eight thousand miles on it. It was like a two thousand four four door Tacoma's, you know, brand new, <laughs> brand new. And it's it's I don't know. Taliban probably drives it around now. Probably, they probably it. fixed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then yeah, one of the trucks, uh, that second truck that came in um, to kind of relieve us a little bit, uh, we ended up having to have that slung out because it was it was smoked. We yeah, holes all over it. So. Um, yeah, yeah. Called in medevac. We we uh, ended up medevac and two of the dudes. Everybody else went out uh, by ground. We linked up with another ODA that came out to kind of relieve us and help us out, bring us. Everybody was black on ammo, water. Like all of our jerry cans were shot through, and I mean, so we had nothing. Um, yes. So yeah, they escorted us out. We got back, and that was that was day one. You know, day one, first and mission. Here's your very first. You know. Um, <laughs> think so but yeah after that the the team um uh team took really good care of me and i was i was at that point i kind of had my intro to the special forces at least on the guard side and i was like man these guard dudes are really cool <laughs> so yeah after that i mean we we didn't have anything quite that serious again we we had a couple small skirmishes here and there we take random fire from you know some some hilltop or some you know uh village but it was never anything like as uh premeditated or, or pre-planned as that, you know? Oh, okay. Um, uh, towards the end, I think it was, uh, February as like mid February. I, my replacement had just shown up. It was a controller named Chris Hoover. I think he's out now. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we, uh, we started taking some pretty accurate, um, IDF. So I don't even know if IDF is, is the right term for it. Cause they were literally walking these one Oh sevens and one twenty twos onto uh, Chapman airfield. Um, and we had a B1 show up. So we, we ended up, uh, what did we get? Two passes. It was like pass a seven and pass a five JDAM. So we dropped wow, 12 JDAMs on his mouth. We <laughs> literally got to carpet bomb a mountain one night. Nice. Uh, so, and that was cool because I, I had obviously established rapport with this team to the point where they refused to address him as like a combat controller. They just kept calling him TACP, which drove him nuts. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, uh, you know, that was like our handover. He'd been there for a couple of days. I still had like a week or two before the red ring came back through. Um, so, you know, I was there into March, but, uh, yeah, his kind of his intro to the team is one night we carpet bombed the mountain. And you know, at that point, not <laughs> that cool, so it was a good handover. Similar to your, similar to your, uh, initial, it's like everybody that comes to that team, you know, they get the, uh, thrown to the fire, like right off the bat. Yeah, except that dude didn't answer any of the questions because afterwards we definitely we had like a um, like a legal pad of papers worth of questions from Jag. It's like who authorized you know uh, the drop? Uh, why did you feel it was necessary to use so much ordinance? It was it was kind of funny. Nothing ever came of it, but I ended up staying up that night. He went back to bed like it was just another day for him, and you know his. Oh. He, I think he kind of towards the end there made me his romad basically, but uh, <laughs> which I didn't like. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, that was a super cool trip, and I still keep in touch with uh, with a lot of those dudes. Um, nice. Sergeant actually became the uh, SEL for the entire Florida National Guard. He just retired like two months ago. Wow, cool. Yeah, Dave Lanham, Sergeant Major Lanham, awesome dude. That is awesome. Yeah. So then you um, you rotated back, and mm -hmm. you're still at the fifth, essentially. Or yeah. had you, or did they say, okay, you're with us now for good? Yeah, the, John, um, you know, with the SF I mean, guys have conversations. The like. matches, like the Teflon John thing, he kind of gets what he wants, never really gets in trouble for anything. You for know? sure, for sure. Um, yeah, he he uh, he kind of brought me over, and I think that was maybe at the objection of a couple of the other more senior dudes there. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, I was I was kind of an idiot when I was younger, you know, and then after we that, all were, dude. you know. Um, after that deployment, I got home in 2004, you know, now my, my ego's inflated a little bit because now I've done it. Right? Sure. It's dead. Yeah. It wasn't luck. It was all my combat skill that got me through. <laughs> right. um, Wait, yeah. so were they pissed that you went over there because they didn't think you deserved it or because they you, they wanted you, you, they didn't think you were experienced enough or like what was the beef with the senior sure. guys? I was, I was definitely immature. If uh, I think if Chris Spann is listening to this, he's probably shaking his head because I was definitely enough <laughs> when I was younger. He was my first supervisor. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think span kind of looked at me um, like a stain on the wall most of the time, <laughs> you know, whatever it was, uh, Courtney and John, I think they, they, I don't know. They saw something in me. Uh, so they, yeah. they, they kept me around. I don't know. Maybe it's cause I was entertaining, but yeah, that didn't last too long. Cause things were starting to formalize, you know, they were starting to do like these selections and um, uh, the 17th, uh, was right around the corner. It wasn't the 17th ASOS yet, but I ended up uh, getting orders to Fort Bragg. And what was ironic about that is Mike Prout, who was out at Bragg at the 14th and wanted to be, you know, there and stay in North Carolina. He got orders to Fort Lewis. So we did this like high five. Yeah. Air Force. It's weird how that happens. I know. Well, it's probably for the best. Um, so I got sent out to the 22nd ASOS, which then yep. became the 17th ASOS OLB. You know, remember we had the OLs for a while and then it became the 17th right. FTS, but um, yeah, I went out to, uh, I went out to Bragg and, uh, you know, we had Mike, Mike Colthart and Kirk and Andy, who's, who are some of the other guys, Pav, Pav's, Pav is my favorite. Yeah. Um, you guys had a good crew there, man. A really yeah. good crew. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I definitely felt, um, you know, and I was still kind of the young guy out there. Most of those dudes had already done, you know, two, three, four deployments. And like, this was going to be my second one right when I showed up. So I was, <laughs> right, right. I was young and goofy. Um, but uh, those guys, Pav, at least, Colthart was really cool, kind of took me under their wing. And uh, Kirk Newman was was uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah. They probably all tell you a mediocre JTAC at best. But I did. <laughs> I was likable, apparently, because uh, I'd get sent out to these teams and do really well. I, I think I missed my mark. I was, like, supposed to join the Army or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, just attitude alone or just, you know, not being a jerk kind of goes a long way. You know what I mean? So if you can, you may not have been the most experienced guy there, but if you can, you know, you got that cred from Lawara, you know, so that, that helps. And then plus you're, you know, you're cool to be around. So, I mean, it, it, they probably, you probably fit right in with those guys. I mean, they're pretty, well, don't pretty get funny. Me so I show up and uh, Paul Britton was there. Um, and I mean, as soon as I get there, I didn't even move my wife and daughter out like uh, Colthart or was it Lance? I don't know. Whoever was, whoever was kind of sponsoring me, if you will, basically sent me an email and was like, Hey man, you might want to think about leaving your wife and kid back there. Cause as soon as you get here, you're going overseas again. And it was like, Oh, okay. This is in 2005. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I remember right, the reasoning was like, yeah, all these dudes have already done three, four deployments. You you can go do your second one now. And it's like, Oh, you know, Roger that. <laughs> right. Right. My wife and daughter just moved down to Oregon with her folks. I PCS, myself over to North Carolina and I was there for like two weeks. I slept on Kirk Newman's couch. Um, and then nice. went overseas again. Uh, <laughs> this time though, and this is my intro to, uh, the 22nd ace off. Um, we show up and they had, do you remember they had those rovers, the, you know, they came in the big Pelican box. You were supposed to take oh, yeah. them out to her. I hated that thing. I didn't understand it. Um, <laughs> so I was just going to leave it in Bagram at the CG soda and, and go to my team and do my thing, make friends and, sure. Maybe, you know, call on some air. Um, right, right. Well, the thing is, my my personal, like, tack box with my 117, my nods, you know, my embedders, like, my islid, like, all the things that I need to do my job as a TACP um, was the exact same size and color as this rover box. So, at, like, 3 in the morning when I'm going to hop on a, a C-130 to go fly over to Kandahar to get on a 47, okay. go out to my FOB or safe house, wherever I'm going, Lo and behold, <laughs> I get to Kandahar, the sun's coming up oh, man. through this baggage pallet. And I pull out what I think is my radio box, but it says Rover 3 on the top. And I'm like, how did I left oh, it? Man. So now <laughs> I have the task of calling back to Bagram to these dudes that I've just, I have just met a couple weeks yeah. back. We knew, you know. Oh, my God. The CJ Sodif uh, ALO at the time was an F-117 driver by trade. Wow. So, you know, he, he's got an awesome attitude already. Uh, right. Yeah. So I have to call and say, Hey, everything I need to do to, you know, my job, to do my job, to be an adult in life um, and a professional. Uh, yeah. I left it behind. <laughs> Can you bring this to me? Um, <clears throat> so. Oh my God. Yeah. I can't imagine well, what those guys well, are saying. Uh, remember when you said, like, I thought, you know, after that first deployment, like, my ego was inflated a little bit. Sure, sure. Brought me right back down to reality. <laughs> um, I'm not as cool as I thought I was. So, uh, yeah, super, super dumb. Very embarrassing. 
Um, oh, I bet your heart just sank when you just saw, you saw Rover on that box. You were probably just like, oh, no. Oh, I, knew, it's like, I knew exactly where my radio box was. It was like, I because I was going to hide the Rover. I didn't want anybody to know I didn't take it. So I just want to use it. <laughs> too much shit. And so, right. you know, um, yeah, uh, I, I called uh, this <laughs> 05. Um, I don't know what he does doing now, but uh, with my, my hat in my hand and, hey, sir, I'm, I'm really sorry. But, you know, he uh, he personally – Deliver. I had a self pilot uh, hop on the next thing, smoke into Kandahar, and personally deliver my kit. Um, really? Uh, did he I, tell anybody, or was he like, did he keep it on the down low, or was he like, oh no, no, not on the down low at all. As a matter of fact, um, Paul Britton had forgotten his kick or something back in the states, like his kick thirteen, you know. Yeah. yeah. So he, they actually, they went, they were nice enough to raid my box for the things that they had left. Um, he, he did leave me a. Um, uh, what was it? it? Was two pieces of bread and a Ziploc bag and a can of soup, which took me a second. Like, oh, soup sandwich! Oh, soup sandwich! That's clever. I got it. <laughs> with a note that said "Thanks for the kick, thirteen, bitch." So that was my <laughs> that was my um, welcome to the OL. So now I'm like, cool. I am starting off great. Uh, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here at Bragg. Now I'm probably going back <laughs> over the fourteenth. Um, yeah. So they set me up with a no notice uh, eval. Um, out at Tarnak Farms, where Colonel the O5 uh, personally um, evaluated me, night live laser uh, out at Tarnak Farms. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to prove that I'm not a complete idiot, and then kind of gave me the old uh, like elbow me in the side, like, all right, don't do that again, idiot. Go. Yeah. yeah. Prosper. So, and then I did, and I had a great, I had a great deployment that one. Um, May third, uh, two thousand five. I was out with the seventh group team. Um, and our 47, we long, I'll keep this one kind of shorter, but, uh, this is actually probably one of the ones I'm most proud of is we were going in to support the 173rd. They had like two companies of 173rd running this Valley in the Arkandab river Valley. It was probably a click, click and a half, um, long the, who was there? JTAC, it was a Faustino Martinez with the 173rd. He was like the JTAC, one of the company JTACs. Okay. He was up north. Uh, they kind of stirred up a hornet's nest. And so the ODA I was with, we were going to go uh, as part of like this cordon and search. Um, once the 173rd had this valley locked down, we were going to go search this village. And what ended up happening is our 47 took so much fire on initial infill that we we had to divert to the south. And then as we were landing yes. in the south, uh, we just we got hit from all directions. I think we took like three RPGs. And Oh, my God. Yeah, we ended up burying like the ramp of the 47. It, it wasn't. It's, I don't know, it's easier just to say like, yeah, we crashed in a 47, but it was able to take back off and everybody was okay. But uh, we we crash landed, hard landed, you know. Um, the 47 took back off, but then crashed like two more times on the way back to the FARP. And then really? from there, they had to take it apart and sling it back to Bagram. Yeah, it was a, a Hawaii um, National Guard 47. Man, good for them. Gee whiz. It had M60s in it, like in the doors. Oh, really? <laughs> Dang. Yeah, um. I spent uh, like 20 something hours on the ground, like the first six, eight hours. What are instead of searching this village, we were kind of on the south side of it, um, of these orchards. And we ended up kind of becoming a blocking force for the 173rd. So the 173rd would just funnel people down to us. And um, we ended up with uh, between Faustino and I, I think we ended up with like six A10 sorties. So like 12 A10s, like four British GR1s four or five Apaches. Um, there was a B1, there was a tanker, like a KC-135. We ended up with a Predator and like two AC-130s that night. Um, yes. Oh, dude, we ran cat. Like it was, it was badass. Uh, <laughs> it was this turkey shoot between us and the 173rd. All we had to do was deconflict like where these 173rd Joes are running around. And yeah, we just, uh, all day we kind of divided the river in half. And Faustino took everything, you know, in like the northern half of the, the river valley we had this like perfect dog leg down at the south and up on the north side so like for units of measure for for talk ons it was simple um and nice. then that night um yeah that night we just shared the ac 130s back and forth we just send them all around and just start hitting these dudes that have been hiding in the ridge lines all day we it was pretty cool at the end of it it was like 78 dead uh equal, really yeah, yeah yeah a lot of them most of them i would say the uh the 173rd dudes got you know you we were, yeah. the next day we're walking up this valley and like there's just dudes with little five five six holes all in them you know and really you know that's just that was joe doing doing joe things in that valley but yeah 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 came across the guy it's like split in half and you're like oh that one was me um <laughs> did you uh did you guys take any fire at all in your team oh, yeah. or was it yeah, just i know all yeah. day um 
I mean, it oh, okay. was like the first six hours we were, we were taking shots from the village, you know, all day. And we kept taking fire from this, this ridge line, um, and could never get eyes on it. I was, I would run like these low angle strafes with the A-10s constantly. And then when yeah. I think finally, like, all right, I'm not hearing anything anymore. I'd get back on the village. Um, and then we take fire from this ridge line again, you know, a few hundred meters away. And we found these same dudes that night with the AC-130. Oh, um, good. And, uh. Yeah, and then we took care of business with the AC that night. But it was just yeah, all day. Like it was it couldn't have been I mean, once we were on the ground it was you know, it was it was our game. Well yeah, once you got on the ground after taking what what'd you say, like three RPGs and uh, a bunch of a bunch of yeah, bullets? There holes all in that forty seven. Yeah, one RPG detonated like right underneath. Um the way the crew explained it to us when we got back was like one didn't detonate, but it like bounced off the tail boom of the uh of the uh of the 47 and like knocked the transmission offline or something whatever that drive shaft that runs from one prop to back to the next like yeah, yeah. Really they had no throttling capability anymore like it was either all or none so when they took back off kind of like rocketed up into the sky and then we see him drop below this this hilltop and we're like okay that helicopter just crashed again and then we watch him like launch up again and off into the sunset and we're like all right well they're not coming back for us so I guess we're hanging Man. here for the day. Because the first thing probably through your mind was like, it crashed up there. Now we got to go up there to secure this crash site or something, you know, and like, thank God it took off again. So you didn't have to go up there. I yeah, mean, we watched been... it basically kind of like leapfrog its way off until we didn't make, you know, see it anymore. And we're like, well, somebody else's problem now it was, you know, ended up right. in a lot, which is our fob that we were at. We shared with the uh, 173rd. And uh, yeah. Yeah. From the sounds of it, it crash landed on the FARP, and then from there, it just it stayed. Maintainers came out from Kandahar or, or Bagram and basically started tearing it apart. So, Jeez. Yeah. That's amazing. But that was a wild trip. I had I got really close with those dudes. Um, uh, still talked to them. I actually just went to one of their retirements. And what's really – trying not to use stupid words, like serendipitous, I guess. Uh, their senior Bravo on that team ended up getting his commission. And then fast forward, you know, a decade or something, um, my last trip to Bagram as a PJ, uh, we pre poed out to like JBAD and, and we were supporting some things that were going on out there in like Nangahar. This is uh, in the time of the Moab. So like uh, I got to watch like okay. the drop from a distance. Um, nice. Well, my former 18 Bravo is out there uh, as a team leader now, as a team captain. Um, huh. And he was running his team in and out of Nangahar. And then... Uh, he ends up small world, man. Oh yeah. Well, no, then like a couple months later, he gets shot seven times in a green on blue, blue on green. What are they blue? We're green. I always get the colors mixed up. Essentially. In a yeah. They're green. Yeah. yeah. Lit him and his team up with a saw. Um, and he had another PJ named Nick Brunetto with him that ended up saving his life on the, on the X and, or helping save oh, him between him and the Delta. And then, uh, he had a former PJ at Walter Reed as his doc when I went to go visit him. So it's like, damn dude, how many times is an air force guy got to save your life? Cause you know, he was <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's, uh, maintained super close relationships with those dudes. Uh, most of them yeah. since, which was, which is pretty cool. But that was my That's intro awesome, to, uh, to, um, Fort Bragg. So yeah, started off what with an intro. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, just get shot down in one CH 47 and all of a sudden things are kind of forgiven maybe. Uh, and then, um, well, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, gee whiz. Yeah. No, things were pretty cool after that. Uh, uh, Chris Pavlich, Pav and I became pretty good friends and I, I think I was still a little bit of a knucklehead. I didn't know what I wanted in life. Uh, moved my wife and daughter out there. Um, didn't know enough about North Carolina not to move like into downtown Fayetteville. <laughs> so that was an adventure. Nobody gave you any guidance. Nobody was like, "Hey, you might not want to move down there." No, those guys like look for house. I love a lot of those dudes, but uh, there's not a lot of mentoring on that side. I think those guys were all kind of well. They were all older, um, a little burnout maybe, and uh, I was kind of again kind of a knucklehead. So I think it was, yeah. like, "Hey, man, sink or swim. You're gonna figure out your life." <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, how was that living living there? <sighs> a little, get a little hairy sometimes. A little <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wife so it was crazy we had kind of a nice little house um but yeah just the location we were i think i was like a half mile from yadkin you know uh, the yadkin 500 but um yeah that's not good it wasn't too bad i mean yeah, you survived obviously yeah you survived yeah yeah so um 
I'm getting ready to leave uh, that second trip to Afghanistan and come home. And before I do, uh, I get an email from Lance McGuire. It's like, hey, man, don't get too comfy. You're going to move your family out here. And then you're going again. So I was home for, I forget, I don't know, a few months, a couple months. I got, you know, I, I basically landed, dropped my shit off, flew out to the West Coast, drove across country with my wife and daughter, moved them into uh, Fayetteville. And then, yeah, it was like a month or two after that. I was, I headed uh, out to Iraq. Um, you guys did that though. I remember that was the, the thing about the difference between like, you know, the Ranger side and the soft side, mm-hmm. like the, the, the oil BU. C and D, and I guess who was E? Was that Rangers or was that SF? Or was that were they combined out there at E? I always I can't remember. I know we were OLB, OL Beefcake, I think is what we called ourselves. <laughs> yeah. OLB. But you guys, I always just remember I would I'd be talking to you or Pav or somebody or somebody, and I'm I am i am like, how long are you guys going? And it's because we would go at the very beginning, we were going like 90 days. Mm-hmm. And then we go it went to 120, and I think my longest one was like five or six months. Yeah. But you guys always went six months. It was always like, well, we're, you know, and, and, and there were so few of you. I felt, I felt so bad for you guys because there were so few of you that it was like, you go for six months, six, seven, eight months. You come back for a couple of months. You go to, for another eight month or whatever. It was very exhausting. It had to be exhausting. I never, I never had the eight monthers. Uh, I kind of like, actually my first three was six, five, four, like in that order. The first one was, oh, okay. it was supposed to be 90 and like at the 90 day, day mark kind of came and went, you know, but I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in, um, I had an awesome team, uh, but yeah. And then it was like, no, 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 we're going to re- send you a replacement at like 120. And it was like at the 120 mark, it's like, no, anytime now. And it was like three weeks later, no, still nothing. Yeah. And then it was like a few weeks after that, a, a combat controller just randomly shows up. It's like, Hey man, I'm here to tag you out. So that one ended up being almost six by the time. I think I was like 172 days or something. Um, but then- that's another thing. It was like, there was no like set. I hate to compare the two, but like for us, we had a specific, your company's going to this time. And like for you guys though, it was more like there were so few JTEX to go around to all the ODAs, which I always hated that. I wish we had more JTEX to fill every ODA. Obviously it's a pipe dream, but there were so many ODAs and so few JTEX that it was like, that it was just the nature of the beast. I mean, you, you had to find, you couldn't leave until another guy got there, obviously. So yeah, yeah man, that had to be challenging. You guys did some long rotations. Yeah. It, it, uh, the the long rotations yeah whatever it was the not knowing and like there was no discernible rhythm it's like hey you're going now you know six days now oh right right as soon as you get here um at least lance yeah the email me while i was still in afghanistan to tell me not to get comfortable um because yeah i ended up leaving for iraq and doing um uh a biop rotation you know they had the the commandos um yep. Got a buy up. yep so i did that and that's where i ran into jared hodges again dude I oh, all right river alaska and we're spending christmas in baghdad together which is pretty <laughs> pretty cool um, yeah and that was a fun trip i worked with fifth group and 10th group a lot on that one because you i mean that was the other thing that sucked it's like i think when you were with the rangers you know you've got your um <clears throat> you've got your battalion and probably your company right and like that's it company yeah yep. like, on paper i was assigned to you know um first battalion seventh group I think I worked with those guys one time on one rotation. Right. I've worked with an ODA from each group to include the two guard groups on every deployment, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It's show up. So each time you got to like prove yourself and like, Hey, I'm not, a, you know, yeah. you know, the only good saving grace for you or for all you guys would be like, Hey, do you know what's his name over at this group? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe they can vouch for, you know, you can kind of get, get in, in that way. But yeah, that'd be just so challenging having to like prove yourself every time you get to a team. Yeah, every, you know, every time I, I learned early on, like, just show up and do the work. Like, if they're stringing sea wire or they're digging, you know, shitters or whatever, like, I'd go out and help, like, the conventional army guys. And it's like that. All right. You know, I'd let them see the the, the egotistical, stupid side of me later. Just, like, for sure, sure. Like, hey, this guy will do the shit work, you know. And, and right. that, that seemed to kind of go a long way. And there's other ways, too. You know, I'd show up with gifts. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm work. Yeah, he's a hero. All right, get in here. Really yeah. You know, <laughs> C yeah. kill anybody here. You know, but uh, yeah, I know the 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 Baghdad rotation was uh, was pretty cool. It wasn't as kinetic as the first two trips, but it was a different side of things doing the commando yeah. and stuff. You know, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun on that one. That was like four months on the dot. But at that point, like I think. Um, I was definitely kind of a little burnout, a lot of, a lot of back and forth. I didn't know that I fit in oh, yeah. best there at, uh, at Bragg. Um, the dudes were awesome, uh, for the most part. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think just getting a little burnout and then, you know, 
marriage. I point upstairs. My wife's upstairs. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we, we kind of needed a break. Uh, oh, for sure. Uh, well, like you were saying, I mean, you, you at each time you barely had any, you know, notification that you were going to go anywhere. So that's a that is a real stressful situation. Like, like how much longer can I do this? That I'm going to get a six day notice and then have to go again. You know, man, I could imagine you'd be enough was enough. I think at that point, I, I reckon. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just, you know, again, not knowing what I what I don't know. Uh, uh, no transition plan. You know, it's like, well, I'm this. Um, I think my EPR says special forces JTAC. That looks really cool. You know? So I thought very highly of myself and my chances to get a job on the outside have to be astronomical. I mean, hell, if you read my last yeah. I pretty much yeah. won the war in Iraq. Um, uh, right. you know, I mean, I wrote my own EPR, so of course I did. Uh, um, sure, sure. but yeah, I, uh, I left, packed up the family, got out and drove home to Alaska to go be a cop. I was like, I'll go be a cop. And like, how hard can that be? You know, it's very hard. Yeah. They don't yeah, yeah. AST or, um, or Anchorage PD. Anchorage PD. No, you don't want to, oh. you know, AST, you're going to end up out in some village or something. Yeah. You don't want that. Plus it's like the military again. I mean, those yeah. guys, you know. Yeah. I have some buddies on, on the trooper side and they, they do love it, but yeah, you're going to end up like out in Bethel or something. Like that's, I'm not going to stay married much longer if that's the, <laughs> that's where I end up. So like, I move my wife to say like constant <laughs> deployments then. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I tried out for, did the APD thing and I met a couple other guys, a couple former Marine recon dudes and they were like same boat. Right. So like we, we did okay, you know, physically, um, pass the initial test, but, the um, the poly and the psych seemed to get all of us, you know? So this pool of guys that I resonated with in the hiring process, um, you know, fast forward eight, nine months cause the, their hiring process sucks. It's super long. Yeah. It was like four or five months in, you know, you, you're like, okay, now you move on to the next step. So you're like a transitioning veteran that needs like kind of a paycheck now. Sure. You know, I started collecting unemployment and that, that started getting that, uh, I was going to be out on the street corner with a cardboard sign soon. Luckily my wife, I mean, she landed a job almost immediately. Uh, she was kind of our saving grace. Um, nice. while I was figuring my shit out, um, yeah. ended up getting booted out of the hiring process, uh, for APD and became a security guard, man. Um, checking IDs at the gate. It paid well. It was like 22 bucks an hour. Where at the uh, base at J bear there. Dude, I was checking okay. IDs at Fort Ridge. Talk about like, a piece of humble pie no um, doubt and you know it's like negative 20 outside and you've got some oh. pfc showing up and he hands you his id and like oops drops it on the ground and you're just like dude do you know where i was a year ago <laughs> like you <laughs> hand it back and you just hear like you know, and you're like cool man i used to do stuff but you know i had a family to support you know so we bought a house oh man um, but yeah, at that point I was like, okay, this was a huge miscalculation. Um, yeah. and I was definitely lost. Um, my identity was tied up in, <clears throat> in what we were doing. Sure. You know, all the kidding aside, like I love that stuff, you know, I, I missed, yeah. I missed, uh, I missed doing it. Um, and so, well, yeah. I mean, I found a lot of people say that like they, we, when you're, I always told myself, don't make any life-changing decisions when you're deployed because when you're deployed it's like man i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna have this and blah 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 and then you get back and it's like oh wait okay everything's fine everything's good don't freak out where were you in and 2005 then, jd i needed that advice <laughs> i know uh, but a lot of people do that they like get out and they're like man i'm stuck you know and then they find themselves in that boat I and mean, it's not uncommon at all i mean it's yeah, yeah. um so yeah i uh I ran into uh, a dude that I went to basic training with. And I mean, here we are in 2007, 2008, I think. Um, I ran into a dude at the BX. I had gone to basic training with this guy and he had joined the Alaska National yeah. Guard as like an aircraft maintainer or something. And then somewhere yeah. along the way, he cross-trained. Okay. Uh, he cross-trained to pararescue. And so that's when I found out there's a PJ team at Alaska. And... Um, he started kind of talking to me in that route. And at the time, what I knew about PJs, uh, I wasn't super impressed. Like my, my impression was kind of like a little bit overrated. I mean, come on, yeah. man, you've been to Kandahar, you see the green bean, you got, dudes, <laughs> you know, they got great hair, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> right, right, um, right. But that's what I remember is like, Oh, four, Oh five. I'd met a couple PJs here and there on the conventional side, um, the conventional rescue side. And like, I didn't sound like they really did anything, you know? Um, <laughs> 
And that was that was my impression. I mean, I'm you know driving around oh the Afghan countryside with Army Special Forces, and I come back occasionally to one of these fobs or something. And there's yeah, there's a dude with lots of cool badges and drinking his green bean. He's living comfortably, but I wasn't hearing any great war stories from the. Yeah, you're like not impressed by this guy, right? No, yeah. not at all. Like, <laughs> um, and so uh, yeah, this dude, uh, my buddy, uh, tries to kind of talk me into the thing. And what the selling point for the Alaska side, besides the fact that this is my home and it's guard is they have a real mission up here. You know? yeah. So I started looking into it and realizing like, I need to um, get really good at swimming, but my eyesight was bad, you know? Mm. I had to pay out of pocket for PRK. Again, one of the things I wish I would have done while I was still in. Yeah. I, mean, I pay out of pocket and get my eyes fixed, and now I have to wait like a year for the waiver. And while I'm waiting, I get um, propositioned by the 125th STS. You know, they just kind of stood up a guard team in Oregon. Sarah, my wife, she's from Oregon. It's kind of like, makes sense. and. I tell them like, well, I just had eye surgery. I don't and like, yeah, we don't care. Like we'll, we can hire you. Nice. So they flew me down there. Um, yeah. I, uh, I took their, their past test and did fine. And then, uh, I mean, within a month or two, I'm back, I'm back, baby. Staff Sergeant Bauer, nice. I'm back on top. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going through the pipeline as a combat controller. And it seemed, you know, I got, it seemed easier, you know, I'm already a JTAC and, and, uh, you know, it hasn't been that long. I can, I can pick right back up. So I go to their selection, their little mini in doc that they ran at the time, the orientation course, no problems. Actually, Chris Hoover, uh, the guy that replaced me in 2003, oh, yeah. instructor down there now. So I'm like, I'm in like Flint, like life's good. Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, and then I go back to Oregon and I'll, I'll save all the details. I'll just tell you, I wrecked a government truck, I uh, ran from the police. We got away. Uh, myself and another gentleman. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This power plant is not on top anymore. Um, yeah, we smoked. It's like a roller coaster with you, man. Smoked this govy into the bottom of like uh, this pylon under I-205 coming around a corner way too fast at night. And then we ran. Uh, cops came, ran from them. We got away. Uh, in our, our brains at the time, it made sense. Like what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the bar that we were just at. And we're going to, we're going to drive back there. We'll get a cab back. And that way I have a receipt. I have an alibi. We'll just say, I don't know what happened to the truck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know how well that went over? <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> My sure own saving well. grace, um, because the chief at the time who, uh, you know, and it's a funny story to tell now, but at the time, sure. I mean, Oh God, I'll be oh, just so, nerved. Uh, such an idiot, you know. Um, and the other guy too. The other guy's an officer now. He's a crow. Uh, nice. Actually, I will say his name. It's Adam Becker, because as far as I'm concerned, he owes me a stripe. Um, uh, yeah, the chief at the, of the 125th at the time and the op soup. I mean, you know, they they were just we were done. We were done. We we're yeah. we we're never oh, going to yeah. be an ST. Uh, shouldn't even be in the Air Force. You know, I mean, when it was all when it was all said and done. Um, it was a, uh, a civilian cop that actually really probably gave me my biggest break. I mean, he, he could have probably hammered me a lot worse than he did when they finally got us. But yeah. I think he saw what the guard was about to do to us. And he was like, dude, he, we ended up with like two misdemeanors. Um, but uh, no, we had Dan Schilling was the commander of the 125th at the time, Major Schilling, former tech sergeant Schilling from Mogadishu. You know, oh, okay. Uh, oh, wow. All right. Yep. Yeah. Like, let, yeah, yeah. I didn't know my history as well as I should have. Like I come to find out who this guy actually is. He's a stow. Uh, yeah. To this day, I'm still not hundred percent why he showed me the leniency he did. I mean, I reached out to so many people, old team sergeants, uh, Earl Colville had just become like the 12 outstanding airman of the year. So I'm, I'm right, right. got a silver star. I'm reaching out to him. Like, dude, please write me a character ref. Like write me something that says I'm not <laughs> a waste, you know, and yeah. don't hang me and give me a dishonorable discharge. Um, so like I'm getting oh all these letters and Hey, this guy is an idiot, but he's not, Man, he's a he's got a heart of gold like don't he's salvageable him. yeah he's not yeah you know he's a good dude um and dan Schilling showed me mercy i ended up with an article 15 and and uh a bust so i, I got knocked down to senior airman um and you lucked out i to stay at the 125th the chief didn't want me there rightly so he was not wrong um i for I, sure for sure i i deserved a lot worse um uh so i kind of went back to alaska with my tail tucked between my i figured okay my my life as a Come controller, attack P, PJ, like I'm, I'm done. Um, I need to find a job at this point, put my ego aside and I'll go, you know what? Maybe I'll follow in dad's footsteps. I'll go be a, a maintainer in the guard. So I went back to Alaska, talked to a guard recruiter. And that's when the chief of the unit up here hit me up and was like, Hey, 
I thought you were joining and then you left, you did the combat control thing, but now you're back. Like what's going on? And I was like, yep, chief, here's, here's what I just, here's what's transpired over the last year. <laughs> and I tell him everything. And, uh, he called me in for an interview like the next day. And essentially the, the, the commander at the time, Tom Stevens was like, yeah, man, I talked to the commander and the chief down at the 125th and like, I expect you to screw up while you're here, but you'll never, never like that. Like the, you get one shot. You can go to NDOC and well, that's, yeah. that's good. So I, I've learned, you know, I think, I think, don't you think that like, since you were, you were kind of humble about it and you were like, you came clean right off the bat and you're like, look, man, I really screwed up. I made, I'm, I'm a dumbass. I made a mistake. That, that probably was like to the chief there at, and down in Anchorage, he's probably like, all right, this guy's got some character. He's not, he knows he screwed up. He's not a complete imbecile, you know? So I, that's probably, I would think that seems like that's where they came. That's from. what I'm hoping. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I don't know. I still talk to him. He, he retired, but he went to work with the squadron. His name's Skip Kula, uh, firefighter as well. He's all, just an all around great guy. Um, yeah. um, but, uh, yeah, he, he, he kind of gave me my second chance and Dan Schilling, um, you know, major Schilling, I think he became Colonel Schilling eventually. I think, I, I don't think he spoke so ill of me that I was like irredeemable, you know, unredeemable. Yeah. I wasn't a lost cause. Right. right. Um, so yeah, uh, I started that process, uh, did in doc, um, uh, went to dive school, did the, did the whole thing, you know, and <clears throat> yeah, the pipeline was long. It was like two and a half, two years, four months, something like that, you know, um, uh, no, no major issues. Uh, the 212 promoted me back to staff when I was eligible again, um, nice. and then came up to the team and, uh, yeah, uh, 20, 2011, October, 2011, I was a full fledged PJ. Nice. And, and then See, it all worked out. It, <laughs> you just tip your nose to the grindstone. No big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> the best part was, uh, my combat control instructors day one of NDOC. Um, when I went down for PJ and doc, like the same instructor that I had a few months prior, like I'm taking the PT test, the pass test for, for pararescue now. And like, I turn around to the pull-up bar and there's like two of the combat control instructors. Like, Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, see the shirt? Senior airman now. <laughs> so, yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. I'm they just it. went like, what the hell is this guy doing? Oh yeah. No, that's, <laughs> a lot of people ask that question actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ask that, uh, she still asks that question sometimes. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, it, it, luckily no hiccups, uh, in the pipeline kept my nose clean, um, for the most part. And then, uh, yeah, first PJ deployment, 2012, uh, we went to the Helmand province, went to Bastion and everything I thought I knew about conventional rescue was kind of thrown out. Um, because we jobbed the fuck out, you know, really? um, at that time. I think rescue and it depended on who your OG, your ops group commander and your, your wing commander were, but you know, in the helm and the priority wasn't so much like rescuing down pilots. It was like anybody and everybody that needed help. So, sure. you know, um, when we had a fantastic group commander and, and we also, we deployed with our own helicopters, like from Alaska, nice. that doesn't always work out that way, you know? <clears throat> yeah. So the guys that we fly with here day in and day out, you know, on real world Alaska missions we're in combat with now. And, um, oh, it's awesome. Um, there was a little shift in the culture at the time. They were getting away from that conventional, Hey, we're just here to rescue down pilots mentality. Um, and that's never really been a PJ mentality. That's always been kind of an air crew mentality, like the, the 60 community, the fighter community, especially, uh, I mean, they, they kind of hoard us <laughs> as like a check in yeah, the yeah. inbox, you know? And it's like, dude, we can, you know, we can do so much more than just right. sit alert waiting for an F-16 driver to punch out, you know? Um, Which never happens, you know. It's like very rarely ever happens. You know, the so. is the last one that I know of. It was like at the end of the runway in Bagram, and the guy actually ran back to the ECP before the rescue squadron was able to launch. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's like what? Yeah, <clears throat> what are we doing here? But they put us to work. They've they've gotten some Army Rex. Uh, the the culture changed a little bit. Um, Bulldog Bite was in 2010. That was 101st uh, out in. You know the Restrepo area, the the you know like oh, yeah. Eastern Afghanistan, that just that meat grinder. Um, yeah, our guys, a few of our guys with some helos out of Japan, I think, prepoed out there in 2010. I was in the pipeline at the time. I'm hearing about all this, and I'm raising uh -huh. my eyebrow like this is not what I thought that you did. Um, and they were hoisting in, you know, helicopters getting shot up, flight engineers getting shot, PJs, you know, getting pinned down on the ground, staying on the ground for hours with. 
you know, army dudes doing the best they can to manage these mass casualties. And I'm like, holy shit, this is, I might be coming into the, you know, at the right time. Like there's yeah. sitting at the green bean in Kandahar, you know? <laughs> right, right. <clears throat> and then, yeah, sure enough, went to the, went to the Helmand province and did uh, almost five months there. And um, we were running 12 and 12, you know, 12 hour shifts. So like day shift, night yep. shift kind of thing. So, um, uh, what's that, what was it, like seven to seven? I forget. Anyway, uh, on my shift, um, I think I ran in four months there, like on alert, uh, 119 Kazavaks. And not all of them are yeah. knocked down, drag out, but there were certainly plenty that, you know, I saw everything from <clears throat> pediatric burns, amputations, gunshot wounds, blast injuries, um, and, you know, everything from civilians to um, partner force, Americans, Brits, a lot of Brits. Wow. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, helicopter uh, shot up a couple times, um, you know, landing in, at like the POI, the point of injury for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then some of them were fob pickups, you know, some contractors got appendicitis and really just want to right. back to base, but you know, um, God, that had to be such a crazy transition from like, you know, being a JTAC and just wreck, you know, just destroying things to that's not even your job at all. Not, not even close, you know, maybe well, personal actually talk protection. To JTAC a lot, um, you know, in the helicopter getting kind of an LZ brief from the JTAC on the ground. It's like, I was that guy yeah, yeah. years ago. Um, and now you're like saving lives. Now you're like protecting, you know, that's such a great, it's a, I think it's a cool transition. I think it's a cool thing to have that you've been exposed, that you have experienced like both sides of that, that spectrum, you know, I think that's awesome. Yeah. In some ways I think, you know, really, really fortunate um, because like what, at the end of the day, we all kind of want to say, you just want to do your job, you know, and, and, sure. I, you know, I got to, I get to run around with some of the coolest cats in the world uh, in the army that I, you know, guys that I call brother to this day. And, and uh, you know, I got to call in airstrikes, you know, and, I got to be attack P kind of at the height of at the height of my game anyway. And then, you know, I, I had that opportunity and then, you know, yeah, I, I got to, um, I had the opportunity to, to, you know, fly into ongoing troops and contact situations and pick up American Marines and, and, and Brits, um, and fly them out, you know, and, and yeah. do medicine in combat. Like, so it's, you know, I'm, I, I definitely count, um, count myself lucky to, to have had those opportunities because the people, you know, and the people I've worked with, I mean, you know, the caliber of guys we, we end up working oh, yeah. inside. It's like, it's, you, you don't find it anywhere else. Right. So, but yeah, seeing that aspect of it, seeing the battlefield from, I guess, the other side, from the air a little bit more, it's, it's a little more unnerving, you know, you, a little more vulnerable. I would yeah, imagine it's like, you know, <laughs> you're riding with your feet dangling out over, you know, you're flying treetop level over the green zone in the helmet valley and you just hear gunshot. Cause they, they take paw shots at you constantly. Sure. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I hated it, but I loved it. It's, but I think by the end of it, like everybody's nerves, all of our pilots, everybody's like nerves were fried. Like it just, oh, so much. I mean, it was, it, we'd run five to 10 missions a day, you know, you're just waiting for the, the alarm. And we, we had a contract with, with, um, I remember who the contract was with essentially, uh, with the scramble call, it was like 15 minutes wheels up tops, you know, you had to be wheels up in 15 minutes. So, um, and that was you know, cat alpha, it's, there's somebody out there missing both legs. Sure. It was so much Yeah. There's a reason why it's 15 minutes. It's not just to screw with you. It's like, because if you don't get out there and if you got there in six, if you're not ready in six, in 16 or what, or more, then that guy could die or whatever. Yeah. So it's all, yeah, it's all a big, yeah, man. It was, it was a wild, that was such a wild trip. Uh, Prince Harry was out there as an Apache driver. Um, <laughs> nice. uh, yeah, we we're literally right across from, um, the Brits, the Brits had an awesome Kazovac capability. They had 47s with like a dock, a security team, a nurse. So it's like you really, you know, and I mean, the helmet was, was, uh, was kicking off, um, back then, you know, the early 2010 era, like the Marines were just smoking people out there and it's, it was, yeah, they were busy. It was, it was pretty gnarly. Um, so again, kind of thrown into that, that meat grinder a little bit right off the bat, but this time, you know, a little more. Yeah, no kidding. Felt. So, yeah, I've always had a lot of respect for like, um, like medics, like, like you guys and, you know, the Bravo, or I mean, excuse me, the Deltas and yeah. the, um, and the Ranger medics. I mean, it's like, it, like, it's real easy for me and you, when you were JTAC to go out there and just kind of like do our job. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to worry about anybody else, you know, like, yeah, we should maybe do some self, some buddy care if we need to or whatever, but man, you got, that's your whole job is to make sure that people survive, you know, and you're rescuing people. I mean, it's just so commendable, man. I, I really get a, a lot of respect for, for like medics 
in, uh, in any medical career field. I dig it. So. Credit's got to be given where credit's due, man. Like a lot of our protocols in the whole pararescue community, I mean, it comes from the Ranger um, medic program. Now, I mean, those dudes yeah. really have led the way. Uh, the Rangers open lab. I'm not trying to fluff you or anything, but like guys like Matt. No, no, they're great. They're awesome. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're amazing. What they've done with blood protocols. I mean, it's wild. Like I, I had a patient um, last week here in Alaska. It was a, a trauma patient. And we are administering blood and we are doing it per the way the Rangers have been doing it for a while. You know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, this has become so commonplace for us that we do it in the civilian setting now here in Alaska. And I mean, it all started with uh, Ranger Regiment and their program. I think Doc Miles, actually, Ethan Miles was the regimental surgeon and he's the one that just took it. We, we just fell in line. You know, it's a good program. Yeah, yeah. Super smart the way Rangers do things. So, um, yeah, they've always been real aggressive. Like the like the. Um... It's finding the best techniques, you know, like it, 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 they never just kind of sit on their laurels and like, well, this kind of works. So let's just keep doing this. They've always tried to, you know, um, you know, innovate and just do more. Like you said, like do smarter things, faster things, you know, more, uh, things that are they're going to last longer, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they, were, they were amazing. I, I they would. I was amazed every time we ever did any kind of like ranger first responder or something, the medics out there were just another level. Yeah, you know, they really like, are like top notch. Them and 18 Deltas have always, always been super impressive. For sure. I'll, I hand it to them. They're, they're better medics than, than most of us are uh, any day. It's just, you know, it's just a different scope, right? Um, sure. we, we do so much more uh, on kind of like the management side, you know, um, we're, we're pretty good at, uh, you know, like incident response, things like that. I mean, we, we respond to all the hurricanes and things. So it's like, we, we kind of kill ourselves sometimes because we, we can't really master any one thing because we're on the hook. For yeah, yeah. It's the, you know, the jack of all trades kind of, uh, for sure thing with us, uh, which makes it difficult sometimes to be the best at any given thing, but you know, well, in your defense, I mean, you guys, yeah, you're medics, but you're also, there's a rescue portion of it that may not need any heart, any medical attention. You know, you, I mean, you guys do, like you said, you're a jack of all trades. There's more to you than just the medical aspect of it. I think, I mean, am I correct no, or that, wrong? I mean, and, and you know, it depends on the team you're at too. You know, you, you go to like a special tactics squadron and most of those guys can be a little more tactical, uh, more tactics. Yeah. You know I mean? What's funny is some of the dudes you meet, you know, they're more, they're more green beret than they are PJ, you know, on the right, right. East side, uh, up here in Alaska. Um, we have a couple different flavors. A lot of the dudes are, are big time mountaineers, you know, um, there's yeah. some guys that have, have forgotten more about mountaineering than I'll ever learn, you know, um, well, which helps. I mean, it's, there's a lot of rough terrain, you know, like yeah, so you're people getting stuck in. glacier rescue ropes, you know, all that high angle stuff. I mean, we, I've got some guys on the team, younger guys that so they grew up doing it, guiding on Denali, things like that. So it's, it's right. Yeah. They're a medic, but also like if there's a high angle mission, I'm grabbing one of those guys. You know, rope knowledge, you know, um, we all have kind of our little niche, I guess. Mine became jumping, uh, right, right. the jump guy on the team. So I love nice. medicine. I love jumping. I still like shooting when I can, you know, but I'm yeah, yeah. more in that man. You guys get, you get an opportunity to shoot. I mean, is there a range down there that you got, do you have to, yeah, is it have, easy for you to shoot or no, do you have to like go to it, rich and it sucks. Um, we've been yeah. to a range. We have a great Cadam guy, uh, two, two Cadam folks, I should say Cadam people. Uh, we have Amber and Sean. And they, they really uh, bust their butts to kind of keep us keep us on the range. Um, but a lot of it's Birchwood um, sharing ranges with some of the local law enforcement. But you know what it's like, dude, shooting outside and it's like negative 30 out. You're not. Oh, yeah. The training value isn't isn't as good when you're you're wearing eight layers of puffy jacket. You're having to <laughs> unzip three jackets just to get a mag out. You know, you're not you're not getting right. Right. Uh, our our Cadam folks do a really good job of trying to keep guys in it during the wintertime. We have an indoor range on Elmendorf. Um, oh, nice. Just to say some somewhat proficient. Um, you know, think about you guys, too. And like you you alluded to, and I'd like to get into a little bit more. But, yeah, you're a you're a combat unit and you you are deployable. But, man, you got you, you guys are busy. I mean, this is this Alaska is a very uh, dangerous place. So, you know, there's people like you, we kind of alluded to with the, with the high angle stuff. There's people climbing or hiking or hunting. They get stuck out there. There's a, you know, some weather comes in, they get stuck out there. There's people stuck in the water down there. I mean, you got the, you know, the Gulf of Alaska is right down there. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a, your real world missions are, uh, more abundant, I would say than most. Would you say that or no? Oh yeah. No, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's robust to say the least. I mean, I've had three, me personally, I've had three missions since Christmas. I had one on Christmas Eve uh, with an OB, um, OB uh, that required blood. Um, 
preterm labor uh, patient. So. Oh yeah, I read about that. Is that the one? Where was that at? In, uh, um, Shek Tulik. Shek Tulik. Uh, yep, Shek Tulik. Uh, yeah. Mom and baby did great and survived. Uh, uh, what was the deal? Like, start to tell me. From, I mean, I didn't. I didn't read a whole lot about it. But what was it? Did they just called you guys and they're like, hey, we're having an yeah, issue? That was one of like three OB missions I think we had just over, you know, a few weeks. Uh, we've given blood four times or five times, four times maybe. I don't know, over the last couple of months. And then that's wow. that's not something we were doing a bunch. You know, we did it a lot in combat, but that's, you know, that's just kind of become more and more uh, prevalent lately. Um, Would you say it's because the... Um, these villages, I don't know if people are familiar with the Alaska villages, but they're a little austere. I mean, they're little, they're very remote and they don't have a lot of amenities. And uh, sometimes, you know, the bigger things like you were talking about, like somebody may need a blood, needing blood is not always an option. Yeah. In so these places. Um, I, the way I like to kind of explain Alaska to people, the state is half the size of the continental United States. And so for people in these villages outside of Anchorage, basically, I mean, that, that, that mission, the last, um, the last blood mission that we, we had with the, the trauma to the neck, I mean, that that patient was four, five hours by helicopter, you know, a 14 hours and 20 minutes total from the time we took off to getting getting him back to Anchorage. I mean, so it's, you know, yeah, austere is, is an understatement. Out here. <laughs> understatement, yeah, and for sure. Resources for such a large state, you know, land-wise is, um, is kind of the limiting factor. I mean, the weather, the terrain, yes, but... Uh, between us and the Coast Guard, we're really the only ones that can handle that weather and that, that terrain. And the Coast Guard has their hands full with, well, you know, the coast. And they can have sure. it. They don't want anything to do with the water up in here. <laughs> um, yeah, we have... Life- it's a little chilly, I reckon, getting in the water up here. Yeah, we have Lifehead. <laughs> um, but, you know, they're a civilian company. Uh, and they, I, I think, do they, I don't even know if they have rotary wing. I think they're just fixed wing, you know. So basically, yeah. if it's at night or in bad weather, uh, requires a hoist, it's, it's going to be us. Um, yeah. uh, you know, the army doesn't really have the capability that we do, uh, the army dust off side, they're trying to kind of up their hoisting game and, and their medical program. But, you know, I think yep. as far as, uh, capability, we're, we're, we're pretty much it. Um, yeah. you know, the troopers used to do a little bit, but they don't have a medic on board. So if it is, you know, if it is a, a, a medical requirement, um, there's not much they can do and they can't fly at night anymore. So it's, Oh, really? Yeah. So half the year they're out, you know, so. Um, do you ever, speaking of those guys in, in any law enforcement, do you guys ever collaborate with those dudes? Yeah. And, you yeah, know, we've done yeah. things with uh, the local uh, FBI office. Um, we've done a lot with the troopers. Uh, we coordinate a ton with the troopers. Uh, we've had some some really weird ones. And, you know, obviously I got to be careful what I say regarding patients and things like that, you know, HIPAA. But oh, for sure. There was there were some strange, strange happenings out there in the uh, out in the bush <laughs> where trooper escort yeah. was kind of required. You show up and it's like, Nothing about what's going on here looks okay, but it's just you and one trooper. Maybe it's best we just go ahead and take this patient and let's let the trooper figure out what he wants to do later on, you know? Yeah, for sure. Strange. Strange. Because you're out there flapping. Yeah, you are You are very yeah. isolated. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's yeah, there's nobody coming to get Alaska, you. So. Um, <laughs> and then the wildlife, that's the other thing. I hate it. Right, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Packs every year. Like That was my first mission really this year. No, no, I guess oh, it's been a year already. No, that was that was one of the first last year. Yeah, bear attack right on Fort Rich, you know. And um, uh, one of our last jump missions was into another bear attack. A hunter shot a bear, should have dead checked it, did not, and that that bear was very much still alive and did a number on it. Oh. Um, plane crashes, Shame. lost hikers, um, injured hikers. You know, so it's we we see it all. Yeah, yeah, and of course, medical emergencies out out in the bush. So, um, yeah, one you got like, maybe don't ride snow machines uh, while you're intoxicated. That's just what I thought. That was like the normal. I thought that was like a standard Alaska practice. Maybe if you, you do, get, if you're gonna do it, maybe just ride them a little slower. Like the yeah. you know you won't be you won't need me so bad when I show up. That's that's something that seems to be a, a theme here in Alaska. Oh, so well, drinking in anything. I mean, whatever it is, they they get to booze it up. Maybe don't go too far from your house if you're going to booze it up. Uh, yeah, or yeah. where it's easy for me to find you. Not like a crevasse <laughs> and a glacier in the middle of the night. Not speaking to anybody or anything specific. Sure, no, just hypothetically. Yeah, hypothetically speaking, that would be a bad idea. Um, yeah, so we 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 do we see it all, and it is kind of cool. Um, 
not that people get hurt, but that we are the asset that gets to respond because I mean, honestly, it keeps us sharp. All the other rescue squadrons, uh, especially on the active duty side, I mean, they, what are they doing now? And, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. The answer is not much. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. The other guard teams have a, have a mission as well, though. Um, it's not, it's not as, uh, it's not every day like, like it is for us, but like the California team, we kind of call them our sister team. Uh, oh yeah. You know, the 131st rescue squad. I mean, they, they get open ocean missions quite a bit, uh, you know, a few times a year. Probably a lot of fire stuff down there too, I reckon. Yeah. I know their helicopters do a lot of that. Um, you know, tote and water, things like that. Uh, but they, they they stay pretty active. Uh, the New York team is pretty cool. Uh, those guys, they had the Tamar mission a couple of years ago where they jumped out, like, was it 600 miles off the coast of the Azores for, you know, two severely burned patient patients on a, on a ship. Oh, really? Oh yeah. They, you know, uh, surgical airways, fasciotomies, you know, gave, I think they gave blood. I don't remember, but I mean, they, they jumped into the Atlantic in the middle of the night and saved these dudes lives basically. So, um, wow. the guard dude, that's the way to go. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys like, it's a, like a real mission. I mean, it's a, I mean, not, and of course no hit on active duty guys. I mean, they're just, oh, they yeah, had their, had, they have their mission, which I mean, they're training for combat. They're training for real world. I mean, they're, you know, for stuff like that. So it's a different, different mission, but yeah, I've always had a real lot of respect for you guys. I mean, the, the two twelfth is, uh, they're always jobbing in this area. I mean, it's really cool. It's, it's um, yeah. I'll caveat to that is I'm not hating on the uh, the active duty PJs. It's just it's the leadership, man. Their their retention sucks. Like we have a lineup yeah. for guys that want to sign up, and so do the other guard teams. And it's like active duty's got to figure their stuff out because uh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, we we are not short on bodies uh, here. Um, well, I mean, like I I talk about I've talked about this in a couple of shows. I mean, like um, the guard is a good deal. I mean, whether you're a tech P or a PJ or whatever it is. Uh, you can, there's a lot of, it's a different kind of mentality, different culture, but it's, you can do kind of whatever you want on the active duty side, but it's a little more, I don't know. It's hard to explain. I guess it's lenient. I want to say, or it's a little more, it, it's more, not quite as, more family oriented, but at the same time, it's more, uh, in a way it's more operationally oriented. I mean, you're, you know, and all I, all I really have to go off of, and I just, I think that was kind of a, um, a fluke, I guess. It's like, you know, my time at the 17th, it was you know, it was just go, go, go. So yeah, we're sure. operationally minded, but man, like to what, to what end? And here there's such a good balance of like, yeah, we're still very much like mission operationally oriented, but you know, your stability and your flexibility that you get in the guard allows you to, to, to do the family stuff, you know, to right, right. be a productive member of your family too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it really is the best of both worlds. Uh, yeah. You know, right now, the way, the way our squadron's running, um, this is, this is honestly, it's like, I'm, I'm kind of like interested. I'm half tempted to just drop my retirement papers now, you know, I'm over 21 now. So it's like, I could retire anytime. And, um, I want to go out on top, like the, the team, like, uh, both in our operations and support side, it's, it's nuts. Like we bring our support folks, um, you know, we're, we're kind of making a more of like a direct support. You know, I think the air force has their their, their buzzwords like multi-capable airmen or whatever they want to call it. And it's like, we've sure. been doing it yep. for a while. Like our support folks actually, like this last mission we went on, our IDMT came out and, and took over patient care on the flight back, you know, in the C-130. Nice. So um, we've brought our AFE folks out on airdrop missions before we're dropping. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we had a fifth group team come up and decide they want to do some mountaineering without talking to anybody. And they got themselves assholed on a glacier uh frostbitten it like it's so easy oh, it's yeah. so easy to do i mean the, even the most experienced guys can just find themselves up against it yeah, yeah. so you had to go get them uh we couldn't get to them um we had to round up a 47 eventually because our, our heat 60s couldn't make it up then the weather was so bad so what we did is we airdropped uh a bundle to them um we had oh, okay. a cool system the micro fly and we dropped a, a bundle of you know extra warmies and and food and because i mean their their shit was getting shredded in the weather and um yeah but uh, it's it's fun to it's fun to say that um, we, we can go help rescue some some fifth group dudes, but um, but yeah, we had our AFE uh, one of our AFE guys like on like throwing the bundle out. You know, we're starting to send some of our support through Jump Schools, Jump Master. Um, nice. I'm running a Jump Master next month, and we'll have some of our support support folks out there just jumping with us. So it's the way we're we're more from the squadron is like everybody is kind of like in on the operations now and it's so easy yeah. to do here in alaska because we get missions every week it's like you know hey med tech hey 
you know, rigor. Like, what are you guys doing? Want to come give me a hand? Like, hop on the helicopter. It's 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 pretty cool. It's just a- yeah, and why not have them out there helping out? I mean, we, or getting exposed to different things. And yeah, I mean, yeah, it'd be an extra set of hands is always nice. So wait, so real quick, tell me about like um, how often do you guys do like because you mentioned the C one the guy the IDMT was doing work on the C one thirty. How often do you guys do that? Like, it's pretty much all not all, but like there's a lot of airborne treatment. I would say mm-hmm. like it, you have to, you have to like treat these guys. It's not, you can't treat them on the, not, you can't always treat them on the ground. Sometimes you got to get them on the bird and out of there yeah. and do it in route. I mean, is that, that's gotta be challenging. Obviously I know it is, but like, do you oh. want to talk to that a little bit about like the difference between like having a stable, you know, platform to work on this guy as opposed to maybe a, a C-130 or a, or a UH or an MH, what do you guys, HH-60? Yeah, HH-60. Yeah. The, so the 130 is, um, it's kind of nice. You got a lot of room. You have litter stanchions. You have you have room to hang things. Uh, if we are fortunate enough to uh, um, have the 130 available, and by available I mean have somewhere it can land where we can put sure. the patient. Otherwise, it's gonna we're gonna spend time in the 60, and that that is a very cramped environment. And yeah. at night in bad weather, while like you're refueling, um, that oh man, that's those are the those are the fun ones, you know. Um, out in Western Alaska, typically, uh, we try to find an airfield for the 130 to land so we can avoid that, just get them off the 60 and into a warmer, you know, roomier environment to work with. Sure, sure. But that's not really the case when you kind of move elsewhere in Alaska. You know, there's a lot of runways, a lot of places the 130 can land out there, but, you know, you start moving more inland away from the coast and it's, you pick up that, uh, that snow machiner that broke his back and, uh, cause he, you know, went over in a crevasse. Well, he maybe <laughs> drank too much earlier or something, but uh, you pick that guy up and there is no airstrip to transload him to. So you just, you have him for the three to five hour flight in the back of the 60 and that 60 is going to need fuel, which is also why the C-130 flies. So you're going to be, you know, refueling in terrain, in weather while managing a, you know, patient that's probably in a lot of pain uh, and needs. Oh, yeah. And so uh, it's, it's challenging to say the least. And we have, I think one of the, the biggest challenges is kind of deciding what not to bring because you never know what you're going to get. And a lot, and you know how it is, man. Um, mm-hmm. You get, you get an idea of what a mission is going to look like or what you're still going to do. And it, when you show up and get ground truth, it's not at all what you expected. Right. You know, so uh, the, the broken back snow machine, or it turns out it's a pediatric patient that broke their leg uh, when they fell down their stairs in the cabin or something. It's something completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you, you really have to pair and tailor like what you want to bring versus what you think you might end up needing. Cause I mean, every ounce is equal pounds and that helicopter is, is pretty heavy already. Um, for sure. And space inside. I mean, it's probably oh, like yeah, challenging. To... Space is, I mean, one full grown patient and two PJs and that you're pretty cramped in there already, you know? Yeah. Um, so... What's the lighting like? I know that I, I know they have lights, but is it like, uh, is it, um, Green. You know, um, yeah, yeah. it's probably hard to see. I mean, it's not, yeah, not the best run, environment. We, we run headlamps and stuff. It's got to be careful at night, you know, not to blind the pilots because they're flying under not. Sure. Um, but we try to keep it as dim as possible. And, and, you know, the other thing is obviously like airway management. you got a patient that's not doing so well and they're laying on their back in the back of a bumpy helicopter. Yeah. You know, you're going to end up inducing uh, some vomit. So air, airway is always an issue. Oh. <laughs> that's one of the first things you want to think of is you, you throw throw some Zofran on board or something to, to, to keep them kind of comfortable. Drugs are good. Sure. Drugs, <laughs> drugs are good. Zofran to keep them from puking and, and uh, whatever whatever uh, narcotic might be uh, appropriate for the situation. So Yeah, forget about the injury. I mean, just a, a normal civilian that's never flown in a helicopter before is going to get yeah. air sick probably. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Compound that with a, frac- a leg fracture or, you know, whatever. I mean, and a heart attack, is. you know, I mean, you, you name it, yeah. you clean it up here. I mean, it's, we see, you know, medical emergencies, traumas, you know, a lot of people just got lost and we go find them and it's like, you take <laughs> off and it's like, oh, there's Talkeetna right there, five miles away. Oh, thanks guys. And it's, you know, you know. <laughs> sometimes it's just somebody that had a bad day and had to run a bad luck. Other days you look at them and you're like. I hope you know better from now on. Like this is yeah, you should have known totally better. preventable, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, no, we have such an awesome group up here. You know, our our we, they call us the triad. We have the two two tenth, two eleventh, two twelfth. The two mm-hmm. helicopter squadron, two eleventh, the uh, C one thirty squadron, and then two twelfth is us. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty. I mean, we were St. Patty's Day was last night, and there was there was there was a triad of people. Uh, <laughs> uh, the triad was representing very well at the bar. So, 
Um, yeah, you guys got a good crew, man. That, that whole, the, all three of those units are, are top notch. I mean, I've never had any complaints about those guys. So wait, I got one more note. Some Djibouti, Africa. Did you, did you do anything with that? Or is that a, is that a thing or no? Yeah. I mean, I've read it. In, I've been there. Did you guys deployed? Okay. So were you like as a PJ or is, yeah. So what'd you guys do over there? Like, what was that about? Um, well, the, the, my first deployment to Djibouti was uh, 2014 and that was a little bit different. Um, myself and a couple other guys, I think because of like my background as a TACP, I ended up going over to the SODIF and doing okay. things over there. Um, with the Navy. And if you can't talk about it, yeah, feel free. Don't, you know, we don't have to talk about yeah. it. I mean, if it's like no, it was, sensitive, it was cool. it was something different, right? Cause like I was so used to, um, Afghanistan, you know, um, yeah, you know, at that point I had done three or four trips to Afghanistan. So like Djibouti, I was, it was a welcome sight. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, uh, I went over to the soda side and did some stuff with the Navy, um, just as like basically a medic, you know, um, they, okay. they, they needed additional medics. Um, a few of us did that. We did a lot of jumping and then, yeah, our, the last trip, I was the op suit, uh, in Djibouti on the last trip. And so I was farming guys out to the soda and then, uh, uh, our helo guys, um, we sent a helo team down to, um, down to Somalia to, to run some Kazavak. Yeah. We, you know, it's Djibouti trips are fun. Like the last one, I mean, you, you know, you've, you've got a nice mix of like, Hey, you might actually get in the mix with some things. Uh, you might yeah. get some, um, get some, some real world time. Uh, but then there's also some really great training opportunities in and around Djibouti. Like I upgraded a couple of dudes. Uh, we, we went diving out, out of the port, you know? Oh man, that'd be nice. It was cool. Djibouti, Djibouti's, uh, uh, I think, uh, in that area is a, is a good deployment. Um, yeah. It would have cool. Been one to kind of wet my beak on before I did all the others. Like, Hey, so this is what yeah, it yeah. looks like, you know, now go to the real one where you go to war. Um, <laughs> right. Right. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Last one. Uh, we deployed during COVID, uh, so we had next to no support from Big Air Force. You know, the all they yeah. tell us is you're not allowed to come to work, but make sure your ISUs are packed. So, like, working those logistical challenges. But the cool thing was uh, nobody really paid attention to us. So everybody, you know, long hair, beards, Hawaiian t-shirts, and it was a super cool <laughs> deployment. Um, nice. Uh, and yeah, and we're we're still we're still rotating in and out of there. But well, cool. Yeah, I just had I just I saw it in a in a like a bio or something. I just thought I'd ask about it. And I knew. Well, cool, man. I, this has been great. I mean, I, I, uh, I hadn't talked to you in forever, so it was nice catching up, but it was also, I, I love the contrast between the tech P and the PJ career fields. I mean, I think it's great. And, um, and I, I can't, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, um, it's really commendable what you did. I mean, you, like, I think it's a good lesson for guys who maybe run into a little trouble in their life and they, you know, you, you didn't quit. You, you took your licks, you owned up to it and look where you are now. I mean, you're like, you know, you're in a great position now. So just, I guess if anybody's listening that has had that kind of situation, just don't give up. And, you know, when you say, I mean, what advice would you give, um, having been there and done that? Um, you know, it, looking back, it's, it's kind of hard to say. I'm like super proud of some of the goofy things I did, but honestly, like, oh, for you sure. know, it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, um, it's really hard to have empathy for somebody if you honestly don't know how to walk in their shoes. So that's, that's one thing, I guess that's kind of how I look at it. It happened. Things happen for a reason other than I'm just, a, sure. you know, I was young. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I should probably put one of my young guys on here. Um, one of my younger dudes and we'll see what they say. Like, yeah, Chris is awesome. It's easily relatable or no, he's just a big dope. Um, <laughs> but I like to think it kind of helped, you know, uh, help me develop my leadership style. And then, you know, I mean, you talk about leadership in the Air Force. It's such a it's 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 such a buzzword for most people. But I mean, you know, to truly have it, it means you, you know you have to have the empathy and the the experience. And and I guess I guess to round it out, like I, I truly think experience is built more on failure. Um, I think ego. I think you know success breeds ego more than it breeds experience. So I mean, when I when I yeah. relay lessons, you know, rarely is it like how cool I was or, Hey, look at this great thing I did. It's a, fu it's fun to tell war stories, but nobody really learns from that kind of thing. You know, like, cool. You're great. Right. You did this good thing. You were good at this, you know, high school prom king or whatever, but, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. that's not helping me any, you know, but helping somebody avoid pitfalls. I mean, that's true experience, right? So for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. We, there was, those times when we forget our kit or, you know, or stuff like that, that's, those really hit home with us. Those really stick in our crawl. And well, it's hard to be we remember it next time. You don't want to lose credibility, you know, um, and you don't want to make light of your mistakes, but at the same time, you know, um, 
I think just being open and honest about them. It's, that's, that's what I've noticed in my career. It's really hard for people to be wrong, you know, especially the guys. Oh, for sure. But the dudes that I respect the most, like I've seen them at some weak points. I've seen them kind of, you know, foul some things up. And it's like, I don't think any less of them. The fact that they owned it, right. you know, that told me like, cool. Like, now, maybe I don't have to own as much sometimes because <laughs> I've had a very <laughs> robust career. But, uh, yeah, yeah. but I mean, yeah, at this point I have nothing left to prove to anybody. So if, if, yeah. if, if my goof ups, if, if the stuff that I've done along the way and the successful war story part of it, I get to tell, like, if I could just throw it all out there, like I got nothing to hide. Like nah. if it helped, I, 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 I think you did good. I think, I think that, uh, you came out on the other side and I, and I, I commend you for it, man. I mean, it's, it's a, a, a lesser man probably wouldn't have done it. So I think it's cool that what you've achieved in your career. I mean, I think you did the right thing. And I think you came out on the other side looking really good. Yeah, I mean, I'm I think still you, thinking, man, I still, uh, I can still, uh, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a senior now. So I spend a lot more time in front of a computer than I want, but I am on alert. I still pull, I'm on alert right now, actually. So if anything happens out in the bush, you see a C-130 flying over, it's, that's me in the back, probably napping. <laughs> <Very right>. uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, if you know anybody that wants a tandem down in Anchorage, send them send them my way. I still get out and jump. Uh, oh, you got your you got your uh, tandem rating? Yeah, yeah. Nice. One of the tandem dudes here. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, I, I love jumping. It's it's so much fun. Oh yeah, I love... so I can still get out and do that stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm. Jay... Um, let's be clear. Let's be clear. You like jumping free fall, not static line. Oh, I'll still get out every once in a while and, and jump static <laughs> line just to just to show like yeah, feet and knees. We still jump MC. Yeah, we yeah. have not transitioned to the MC6 yet, so I still go old school. My one of my last static line jumps was at 800 feet still. Oh my god. That's the other thing. The PJs like they don't like we did that a lot when I was at Bragg. Like they don't do that stuff here. It's like it's got to be no, 1250 no. or 15. I like they jumping below 1250 is like scary to them. It's like I remember jumping with Army like you want to see, yeah, it was like the eighty stand a mass stack with eighty second. And tell me how like scary jumping is, you know? <laughs> no. That is scary. Yeah, <laughs> all the equipment coming out and everything, oh, all the, from the sky. Yeah, all, all the Muldoons in the air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, JD, I really appreciate you having me on, man. Um, I, yeah, thanks again, man. I, this was awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, and uh, see, who, who was I listening to? I was trying to get a feel for like how we do this. Uh, Brandon Temple. Oh yeah, yeah. Earl Colville. I'm just trying to think of some of the some of the some of the other influential guys I've I've, I've worked with along the way. Um, well, BT was on here. I'm I'm talking to Earl. I'm trying to get him on here. He's uh he's he's he is thinking about it. Yeah. So hopefully he does. Well, yeah, Earl, you're listening. Up. You should you should do it. Get on. <laughs> Be the open book. Yes. Okay. So we got off a little early uh, from the last episode. We forgot to talk about the Alaska Pararescue Association. So I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that and kind of how you're involved in that and, and tell me all about it. Um, yeah. So uh, that was one thing we kind of, we kind of got off on a tangent. I think, um, <laughs> Yeah. you know, going down the, the old days road uh, there uh, kind of easy to do, but um, no, as, as uh, things progressed here in Alaska, we had, I think uh, in the previous conversation we had, we talked about, you know, some of the, some of the PJs I met here that, that stigma of like, you know, pararescue, not doing a whole lot in combat, you know, kind of being on the hook right, more right. the down fighter pilot rather than the Kazavak. That 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 dynamic kind of changed and shifted there uh, early 2010s, if you will. And, and then we started seeing a lot more um, of the kinetic side of things. And so as the former TACP coming in, I was definitely surprised at how much there was. And then some of the things that I was seeing, um, even as a younger guy to the squadron, but not so much of a, a new guy to the military, uh, definitely resonated. It was, it was things that I, I had seen along the way with some of our, our bros, especially on the, you know, 17th side of the house on the, on the Ranger and the soft side of the house back in the day, you know, sure. um, you know, we've had a lot of guys and I'll just, I'll say one Earl Koval. Uh, he's the reason why a lot of us, uh, here in Alaska have actually attended NICO. I mean, the idea came from him, uh, him and, and Courtney Henson actually, were the ones that kind of brought that up. So we started navigating our way through some of these different programs the military offered. But one of the things we kept running into is, you know, we're, we're air crew, we're on flight status. And that, that is a huge hindrance and air force processes have not caught up to um, what's actually required to take care of uh, us and our unique, you know, career fields. And I'm not sure. just talking about pararescue. I'm, I'm talking about TACP, combat control, uh, weather reconnaissance, whatever they are now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, with these processes, really, we, had, we were able to identify a lot of shortfalls. And I mean, and, and, you know, it's it's the I hate to say it, but it's the standard stuff. You know, you start seeing marriages fall apart. You start seeing some behavioral health changes, some decision making, some impulsive 
behaviors. Um, people sure. were doing things that were out of character. And uh, we had some candid conversations. The one thing that I, I was able to kind of bring, I think, from uh, my previous experience there at the 17th was uh, this wasn't foreign to me. You know, um, it's, it wasn't foreign, unfortunately, to our career field, the TACP career field. And um, I think with pararescue, or at least in the Alaska side, really, you know, getting into the fight there pretty strongly, especially like in the bastion days of the early 2010s, um, the Kunar province, we had some guys, Roger Sparks, he's, he's a pretty prolific member of the pararescue team up here. He's retired now. Um, some of the things that I think were not foreign to us, you know, uh, in the TACP, TACP side of things, like they were really starting to navigate those issues here. Okay. Um, and so that, that kind of went down a rabbit hole of like, well, what, what, is available out there. And we kind of started hitting some of the easy buttons based on what guys were telling me, you know, guys like Earl Colville, Courtney Henson. And uh, what we really identified is to navigate these processes. It was about drug deals, um, figuratively, not literally. Oh, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, knowing the right flight doc or, or uh, knowing the right person in, in this, you know, service to maybe hook us up and look the other way when they write a referral. And it's just, that's not the right way to do business, you know? So, Fortunately, we've had leadership teams throughout my time here in Alaska that have always been supportive of making sure guys get get back up, you know, to their their full potential or, or at least help them be as successful as possible on their way out. And that kind of, you know, fast forwarding past, hey, we started navigating some of these processes. Fast forward to um, about a year, year and a half ago, we started um uh, looking at other ways to kind of help out, not just the guys in the rescue community, but just around the wing, you know, kind of keep it Alaska centric, nothing big. We didn't even have big dreams of a nonprofit or anything crazy like that. Uh, one of our younger guys, uh, uh, an E6, E5, E6 at the time was like, why don't we take our team fund and make it a nonprofit? And then we can avoid some of these tax implications. And when help is needed, we we can just give, give, give. And there's no there's no issue. So we, we did unfortunately have to give to some family emergencies around the uh, Alaska Air National Guard. We you know helped out some of our own guys. And then um, uh, finally, the culminating event, I guess, was one of my younger dudes, uh, Alan Michael Armstrong, a uh, young staff sergeant. He just made staff. He's a part timer. And for those that aren't familiar with you know the guard, um, you've got AGRs and DSGs or DSGs are what we call part timers. They have a civilian life outside of the military. Um, a lot of them, you know, have a second job or they contract or they go to school full time on a GI bill. And that's where their primary source of income comes from. And that's what he was doing. He was a full time PJ and then he dropped down to part time so he could go back to school. So one of his primary sources of income is um, the GI bill. And uh, at the time, his wife was pregnant with their, their third child. They had twins on the first go around and then number three is on the way. And uh, how old was he? He was 29 years old and diagnosed with a brain tumor. So. Um, which again, uh, I don't know, maybe I watch the news too much or too much Instagram or something, but it seems like that's becoming a, a, a thing lately too, um, is, uh, is rare cancers. So, uh, I guess I should be real careful how I, I word this. Cause I, I don't, this is, this actually doesn't fall on our local leadership, but definitely, uh, I will throw spears at air force processes and how long they take to catch up, but he was a part-timer and he was not on status when he was diagnosed. Um, and so now uh, my leadership, local leadership here, the squadron, and even the group and wing level kind of found themselves at odds with Big Blue as to whether or not we could prove it was service connected. Meanwhile, this dude is having seizures. He doesn't recognize his wife's face. She's 30 something weeks pregnant. So she's right around the corner from delivering their third child. He's no longer collecting a GI bill because she can't go to school, you know, oh with having seizures and don't know how to, you know, perform basic daily functions. Sure. Um, so they really hit a hard road and we kind of, we found ourselves scrambling to pass the hat, so to speak, you know, trying to uh, uh, help this family out. And this is one of our guys, you know, and this yeah. is one of the times where it's like, we shouldn't have had to, the, the big air force should have taken care of them. It shouldn't have been a no brainer. Right. Uh, unfortunately we, we did have to, and that's kind of where um, Jared Taylor comes in. Um, I uh, tried to refrain from Black Rifle Coffee. It was actually just Jared kind of on his own, offered some friendly advice uh, from the nonprofit side. He helped us out a lot with standing it up. Um, right. We could avoid some of these pitfalls. And I, I think between a GoFundMe and what Jared helped us out with, uh, not only donating his time and money, but also just pointing us in the right direction, uh, we ended up with like 75 grand after like two weeks. Wow. And so essentially, we were able to pay Alan Michaels um, – 
bills and his wife's, you know, their, his family's bills for a year while we waited for the air force to kind of catch up, which nice. that's, that was a year, year and a half ago. Um, and, uh, fast forward, she delivered their third child successfully. It's one of his first lucid memories, uh, his most <laughs> first vivid memories after go- undergoing kind of an emergency brain surgery. Um, uh, he's got a pretty incredible story and he's back at the squadron now, uh, actually trying to get back up on status after having that brain tumor removed. Nice. So, um, but that was the catalyst behind, behind all of it was just really, um, one of our younger guys, uh, Sergeant Stike Leather, Dan Stike Leather, he's a newer, well, he's not anymore, but he was a kind of a newer PJ at the time, just thinking outside the box about how we can do some things and the timing worked out. Um, really fortunate for Alan Michael. Um, because yeah. you know, we have this nonprofit just because of somebody's really good idea and hard work. And then Alan Michael, of course, you know, uh, unfortunately was kind of the first test bed for that. So our goal now is not to have to react to an emergency anymore. And, you know, there's, there's a million foundations out there and associations and, and nonprofits, but, um, and they all want to do well and they want to do well for everybody, but we're, mm-hmm. we're a little more unique and we're kind of isolated up here that we, we, you know, Alaskans true to Alaskan form have to take care of each other. So definitely. Um, you know, in that time, we've had members from around the wing, uh, there, you know, um, veteran suicide is a thing. So we have supported more of those than we care to, you know, want to have to, um, our own community, uh, three off the top of my head, uh, one right here in the uh, wing here in Alaska, and then two out, others out in the community, um, on the, uh, pararescue side. On top of that, we were able to take care of some of the retirees, um, some of the retirees as well as teammates of some of the guys that were affected. So things like sending guys down to memorials, sending guys out on resiliency retreats or getting guys paid for to go to like Exos. So, I mean, that's another great example. You know, we have, I can walk through my squadron and throw a rock in any direction. I'm gonna hit somebody in a cast, you know, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And, and as you and I know, um, I don't know. Well, maybe you don't, maybe you, you, you get out of bed without aching in the morning, but I, I <laughs> no, can't no. up anymore, dude. No, no, no kind of the roll, the roll out of bed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you gotta get warmed up. You get, yeah. You don't, nobody jumps out of bed anymore and just starts running anywhere. Yeah. No. And to convince some of these, uh, 25, 30 year old, you know, supermen that, that, that this is right around the corner for them too, if they don't take care of themselves is, is kind of a hard thing. So, um, this is, this is kind of where it falls in line and we've got some lines of effort and I won't go down the list or, or bore anybody, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, the preservation of our, our, our force and our families. I know that's kind of a, a buzzword in the Air Force, POTA for whatever, but, um, you know, our, our big intent is, you know, take care of Alaskans first, but we're kind of here for uh, all the career fields um, in that, in that special warfare realm now. So nice. um, we, we have close ties with a, a lot of people from a lot of different career fields. And so really, you know, there's nothing off the table, but what we need to do is get the word out, you know, and, sure. um, we're not great at self-promoting. I think that's, yeah. I think that's probably common across the board. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to take an opportunity to talk about the Alaska Pararescue Association, not to be confused with like the PJ Foundation or, or some of the other bigger, broader um, <clears throat> organizations, you know. Yep. So we're, we're just one more, but we, we do have a little bit more of a narrow focus um, with the with the willingness to help anybody that needs it. Uh, right now, we have the ability to help uh, uh, only a small portion. So. Um, yeah, a big shout out to to Jared Taylor for for jumping right in. He hopped on our board initially to kind of kind of help get things going, and now we're off oh, and running. So, yeah, he's a pretty good he's pretty good at that kind of stuff. I mean, he set up a he was integral in setting up the Tech P Foundation or the Tech P Association again, and, mm-hmm. and making it into a nonprofit. So, I mean, I think it's important. I think some people say there might be too many, but sometimes you just need that. Like you were saying, you have you have a small community, and uh, having that having someone that, that is aware of what's going on in that small community is almost better than having an overarching uh, uh, entity looking into it, you know, not to say that you wouldn't receive help from those guys and probably ask, you know, help from the, the larger ones, but, you know, sometimes having a close knit group where you all know each other and you're, you, you know, you see exactly where the money's going and it can yeah. be extremely beneficial for sure. And like you said, Alaskans have a tendency to help Alaskans more than anybody else. So, you know, that could be an, a draw to, for people to help out as well. So no, I think it's great, man. I think that's, uh, um, I'm really sorry to hear about that uh, guy, but I'm glad he's, um, you know, back on his feet and getting better. He's, and that's, he's alive and kicking. And, and just for the record, he's a, uh, he's a budding tattoo artist. He's an amazing artist. 
Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, he's got his hands back. He's already starting to get back to work on that side of things. And he spends most of his day at the unit, just knocking out a lot of the ground training. Um, we're still working for his flight status, but we're optimistic. He'll be, he'll be back out and on alert rescuing Alaskans again soon. So that's good. Um, uh, so far, uh, pretty big, happy ending. Um, yeah. you know, it doesn't always work out that way, but yeah, I, I think, um, you know, not, not having to react to these inevitable emergencies that are going to crop up from time to time um, is, you know, probably a big line of effort, but also, you know, taking care of the families, providing some of that insight and mentorship to like the spouses, especially the the younger ones that are still figuring mm-hmm. out what this is going to look like after 15, 20 years. Right. Um, and then again, I think one of the biggest ones that we're really kind of honing in on um, this fiscal year is, um, you know, when you when you leave this stuff, and I kind of found out a little bit when I left the TAC B side and got out of the Air Force completely, is like that disconnection, you know, that loss of identity a little bit. Yeah, and yeah. one of the things we like, especially being a guard team here, I mean, a lot of these guys spent a majority of their time here and have some crazy stories. And for them to get disconnected like that, um, I think is kind of a foul just on us culturally, on, on us, you know, all big Air Force culturally. So one of the things we're really trying to focus on is like when we do have a big event or, um, you know, God forbid, uh, a tragedy, you know, we roll those guys in so they know that they're still just as much part of this family as anybody else. So things like that are, we're, we're, we've got some big goals in the future. Um, the association does, but uh, for right now, we're, we're, we're not trying to overstep or, um, out drive our, our ability. So the only way that's yeah, going to yeah. change is if just get the word out, you know? Yeah. Well, I think it's a testament to you guys. I mean, you, you saw an issue. You didn't you didn't wait around for someone to help you. I mean, you you took the initiative. And I think I think that's what's happening a lot in, in, in the technique community. I know, like I, I mentioned Tommy Case a lot, but, you know, he's leaning forward a lot in, in that regard. And, you know, Jared Taylor is another guy that leans forward. I think I think the days of us waiting on the Air Force to help us, not that they don't help us, but, you right. know, the bureaucracy of it is just such a big entity that sometimes that you know, that it's a slow moving process. So instead of waiting around for that process and having people fall, you know, kind of get left behind, I, I like the idea of guys just taking over and taking the initiative to help those guys until they can get the, the big air force or official help. I mean, it's great. Sure. I think it's awesome. Yeah. It's a great stop gap. And in the event that the air force can't help, cause sometimes, you know, AFI, right. Yeah. So, yeah that's right. right. <laughs> There's, Sorry, my hands are tied. You know, you meet, right, you meet right. enough of those people in your career, I'm sure, where like no oh, is yeah. the first answer you get. Oh, yeah. And you got to try, keep trying like multiple times to get to yes. And sometimes you don't even get there. And it's very yep. frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. I wish they would adopt. That's a good, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but I wish more yeah. government agencies would adopt the mentality of yes for, or let's work to yes, as opposed to no first. You know, mm-hmm. that seems like the party line that they, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want to paint everybody with a broad brush, but it seems that way, you know, so mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, anybody that's spent yeah. a significant amount of time in the Air Force, I think, knows what we're talking about. So <laughs> for sure, for sure. Cool. Yeah, you know, another thing, uh, a good point you brought up about tying guys in that have already uh, kind of like moved on. Mm-hmm. Not only are you keeping them in the community, but you're also getting information from them, like, hey, when you were here, how was it? You know, because a lot of this, all that corporate knowledge and a lot of that experience goes away if you don't keep mm-hmm. them in the fold. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. We yeah, have to guard a little, a little more than uh, maybe some other places, just because things, um, things tend to stick around a little more. Yeah. Um, we see a lot of our, our retirees and the guys that have separated and moved on. We still, we still have the opportunity to see them quite a bit. But uh, yeah. I was trying to think of how to work that in, but you, you segued it perfectly. Um, you know that institutional knowledge, uh, that experience. You know, um, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've reached out to like Earl or Courtney or right, you know, Johnny Knipe. Um, yeah. And talk to them about like what it looked like kind of on the other end for retirement, medical retirement, the VA benefits. And, and they have their wealth. Guys like that are a wealth of knowledge. And so keeping, mm-hmm. keeping guys like that around, you know, to kind of help the next guy out when they're when they're figuring their shit out on their way out. You know, that's that's yep. I think that's more important than some guys realize, at least oh, until for sure. in my boat or your boat. You know, I'm 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 staring down the barrel of 22 <laughs> years now. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, I'm right around the corner. So <laughs> right, right. I have no clue what I'm doing when I grow up. So those guys yeah. have, you know, having them stick around to kind of like, you know, guide me again, having, you know, them have to like take me under their wing again after all this time. It's, right. It's <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, and I, I can't speak for them, but I, if I had to assume, I would assume they're, they're, they're willing to do it. You know, they, they're mm-hmm. happy to do it. I mean, I, I know I love, I, I love to 
you know, impart as much knowledge as I can onto guys because a, a lot of times we try to do it ourselves and that, that hardly ever works out, you know, it's just, and even yeah. if it does work out, it's so much legwork and so much time wasted trying to figure it all out as opposed to just like reaching out to a buddy and being like, Hey dude, what did you do in this situation? And they're like, just go here and do this. You know, Mark yeah. Foster, he's like, he's a good proponent. He's, he's all over, yeah, Mark. Uh, you know, his social yeah. media, he's like helping people out. And there's a lot of guys out there that are willing to help. So yeah, for all, anybody listening, don't be afraid to reach out. Don't feel dumb. Don't feel embarrassed. You know, it's, it's, it's important for us to share that knowledge. Cause if I had to guess, I would, uh, it, uh, well, I don't want to have nothing. I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say that they almost, it's by design that is so hard, but it could be, I don't know. But if you, the more people that uh, share their knowledge, the better, I think. For yeah. Sure. Maybe we have a conversation off the camera over some beers or something. Cause I oh my God, yeah. might fall in line with uh, pretty closely with maybe what you were, you were, you were alluding to there. Yeah. It just seems, it just seems that way, you know, just, it, mm-hmm. it's, yeah. So it's like but the yeah. DMV, they don't want you to get your driver's license. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, like, there. it's no. like, why are the, all these government agencies so hard to, to navigate? Yeah. It's just mm-hmm. weird. Okay. Well, no, I'm glad we got back together. I want to, I think that stuff's important. I think everything you said, I think we people getting this information out is important and know people knowing that these kind of um, things are out there and what you guys are doing. I think that, yeah, I'm glad we linked back up. So yeah, yeah for, for sure. sure. Yeah, man. All right, brother. Cool. Well, thanks, J.D. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care.